Section 47 of Gray's Anatomy, Part 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Anatomy of the Human Body, Part 2, by Henry Gray. Muscles and Fasci of the Forearm, Part 2. 2. The Dorsal Antibrachial Muscles. These muscles are divided for convenience of description into two groups, superficial and deep. The superficial group, brachioradialis, extensor carpi radialis longus, extensor carpi radialis brevis, extensor digitorum communis, extensor digiti quinti proprius, extensor carpi ulnaris, and coneus. The brachioradialis, supinator longus, is the most superficial muscle on the radial side of the forearm. It arises from the upper two-thirds of the lateral supracondylar ridge of the humerus and from the lateral intermuscular septum, being limited above by the groove for the radial nerve. Interposed between it and the brachialis are the radial nerve and the anastomosis between the anterior branch of the profunda artery and the radial recurrent. The fibers end above the middle of the forearm in a flat tendon, which is inserted into the lateral side of the base of the styloid process of the radius. The tendon is crossed near its insertion by the tendons of the abductor pollicis longus and extensor pollicis brevis. On its honor side is the radial artery. Variations Fusion with the brachialis tendon of insertion may be divided into two or three slips, insertion partial or complete into the middle of the radius, fasciculi to the tendon of the biceps, the tuberosity or oblique line of the radius, slips to the extensor carpi radialis longus or abductor pollicis longus, absence rarely doubled. The extensor carpi radialis longus extensor carpi radialis longeur is placed partly beneath the brachioradialis. It arises from the lower third of the lateral supracondylar ridge of the humerus, from the lateral intermuscular septum, and by a few fibers from the common tendon of origin of the extensor muscles of the forearm. The fibers end at the upper third of the forearm in a flat tendon, which runs along the lateral border of the radius beneath the abductor pollicis longus and extensor pollicis brevis. It then passes beneath the dorsal carpal ligament, where it lies in a groove on the back of the radius common to it and the extensor carpi radialis brevis, immediately behind the styloid process. It is inserted into the dorsal surface of the base of the second metacarpal bone on its radial side. The extensor carpi radialis brevis, extensor carpi radialis brevior, is shorter and thicker than the preceding muscle beneath which it is placed. It arises from the lateral epicondyle of the humerus by a tendon common to it and the three following muscles. From the radial collateral ligament of the elbow joint, from a strong aponeurosis which covers its surface, and from the intermuscular septa between it and the adjacent muscles. The fibers end about the middle of the forearm in a flat tendon, which is closely connected with that of the preceding muscle, and accompanies it to the wrist. It passes beneath the abductor pollicis longus and extensor pollicis brevis, then beneath the dorsal carpal ligament, and is inserted into the dorsal surface of the base of the third metacarpal bone on its radial side. Under the dorsal carpal ligament, the tendon lies on the back of the radius in a shallow groove, to the ulnar side of that which lodges the tendon of the extensor carpi radialis longus and separated from it by a faint ridge. The tendons of the two preceding muscles pass through the same compartment of the dorsal carpal ligament in a single mucous sheath. Variations. Either muscle may split into two or three tendons of insertion to the second and third or even the fourth metacarpal. The two muscles may unite into a single belly with two tendons. Cross slips between the two muscles may occur. 
The extensor carpi radialis intermedius rarely arises as a distinct muscle from the humerus, but is not uncommon as an accessory slip from one or both muscles to the second or third or both metacarpals. The extensor carpi radialis accessorius is occasionally found arising from the humerus with or below the extensor carpi radialis longus and inserted into the first metacarpal, the abductor pollicis brevis, the first dorsal interosseus, or elsewhere. The extensor digitorum communis arises from the lateral epicondyle of the humerus by the common tendon from the intermuscular septa between it and the adjacent muscles and from the antibrachial fascia. It divides below into four tendons, which pass, together with that of the extensor indices proprius, through a separate compartment of the dorsal carpal ligament, within a mucous sheath. The tendons then diverge on the back of the hand, and are inserted into the second and third phalanges of the fingers in the following manner. Opposite the metacarpophalangeal articulation, each tendon is bound by fasciculi to the collateral ligaments and serves as the dorsal ligament of this joint. After having crossed the joint, it spreads out into a broad aponeurosis, which covers the dorsal surface of the first phalanx and is reinforced in this situation by the tendons of the interossei and lumbar callus. Opposite the first interphalangeal joint, this aponeurosis divides into three slips, an intermediate and two collateral. The former is inserted into the base of the second phalanx, and the two collateral, which are continued onward along the sides of the second phalanx, unite by their contiguous margins and are inserted into the dorsal surface of the last phalanx. As the tendons cross the interphalangeal joints, they furnish them with dorsal ligaments. The tendon to the index finger is accompanied by the extensor indices proprius, which lies on its honor side. On the back of the hand, the tendons to the middle, ring, and little fingers are connected by two obliquely placed bands, one from the third tendon passing downward and lateralward to the second tendon, and the other passing from the same tendon downward and medial word to the fourth. Occasionally, the first tendon is connected to the second by a thin transverse band. Variations An increase or decrease in the number of tendons is common. An additional slip to the thumb is sometimes present. The extensor digiti quinti proprius, extensor minimi digiti, is a slender muscle placed on the medial side of the extensor digitorum communis, with which it is generally connected. It arises from the common extensor tendon by a thin tendinous slip from the intermuscular septa between it and the adjacent muscles. Its tendon runs through a compartment of the dorsal carpal ligament behind the distal radio ulnar joint, then divides into two as it crosses the hand and finally joins the expansion of the extensor digitorum communis tendon on the dorsum of the first phalanx of the little finger. Variations An additional fibrous slip from the lateral epicondyle. The tendon of insertion may not divide or may send a slip to the ring finger. Absence of muscle rare. Fusion of the belly with the extensor digitorum communis not uncommon. The extensor carpi ulnaris lies on the ulnar side of the forearm. It arises from the lateral epicondyle of the humerus, by the common tendon, by an aponeurosis from the dorsal border of the ulna in common with the flexor carpi ulnaris and the flexor digitorum profundus, and from the deep fascia of the forearm. It ends in a tendon, which runs in a groove between the head and the styloid process of the ulna, passing through a separate compartment of the dorsal carpal ligament and is inserted into the prominent tubercle on the ulnar side of the base of the fifth metacarpal bone. Variations Doubling Reduction to tendinous band Insertion partially into fourth metacarpal In many cases, 52%, a slip is continued from the insertion of the tendon anteriorly over the opponens digiti quinti. To the fascia covering that muscle, the metacarpal bone, 
the capsule of the metacarpophalangeal articulation, or the first phalanx of the little finger. This slip may be replaced by a muscular fasciculus arising from or near the pisiform. The anconeus is a small triangular muscle which is placed on the back of the elbow joint and appears to be a continuation of the triceps brachii. It arises by a separate tendon from the back part of the lateral epicondyle of the humerus. Its fibers diverge and are inserted into the side of the olecranon and upper fourth of the dorsal surface of the body of the ulna. The deep group, supinator, abductor pollicis longus, extensor pollicis brevis, extensor pollicis longus, extensor indicis proprius. The supinator, supinator brevis, is a broad muscle curved around the upper third of the radius. It consists of two planes of fibers, between which the deep branch of the radial nerve lies. The two planes arise in common, the superficial one by tendinous and the deeper by muscular fibers, from the lateral epicondyle of the humerus, from the radial collateral ligament of the elbow joint and the annular ligament, from the ridge on the ulna, which runs obliquely downward from the dorsal end of the radial notch, from the triangular depression below the notch, and from a tendinous expansion which covers the surface of the muscle. The superficial fibers surround the upper part of the radius and are inserted into the lateral edge of the radial tuberosity and the oblique line of the radius, as low down as the insertion of the pronator teres. The upper fibers of the deeper plane form a sling-like fasciculus, which encircles the neck of the radius above the tuberosity and is attached to the back part of its medial surface. The greater part of this portion of the muscle is inserted into the dorsal and lateral surfaces of the body of the radius, midway between the oblique line and the head of the bone. The abductor pollicis longus, extensor os metacarpi pollicis, lies immediately below the supinator and is sometimes united with it. It arises from the lateral part of the dorsal surface of the body of the ulna below the insertion of the anconeus, from the interosseous membrane, and from the middle third of the dorsal surface of the body of the radius. Passing obliquely downward and lateralward, it ends in a tendon, which runs through a groove on the lateral side of the lower end of the radius, accompanied by the tendon of the extensor pollicis brevis, and is inserted into the radial side of the base of the first metacarpal bone. It occasionally gives off two slips near its insertion, one to the greater multangular bone and the other to blend with the origin of the abductor pollicis brevis. Variations More or less doubling of muscle and tendon with insertion of the extra tendon into the first metacarpal, the greater multangular, or into the abductor pollicis brevis or opponens pollicis. The extensor pollicis brevis extensor primi internatii pollicis, lies on the medial side of, and is closely connected with, the abductor pollicis longus. It arises from the dorsal surface of the body of the radius below that muscle, and from the interosseous membrane. Its direction is similar to that of the abductor pollicis longus, its tendon passing the same groove on the lateral side of the lower end of the radius, to be inserted into the base of the first phalanx of the thumb. Variations Absence Fusion of tendon with that of the extensor pollicis longus. The extensor pollicis longus, extensor secondi internatii pollicis, is much larger than the preceding muscle, the origin of which it partly covers. It arises from the lateral part of the middle third of the dorsal surface of the body of the ulna below the origin of the abductor pollicis longus and from the interosseous membrane. It ends in a tendon, which passes through a separate compartment in the dorsal carpal ligament, lying in a narrow oblique groove on the back of the lower end of the radius. It then crosses obliquely the tendons of the extensoris carpi radialis longus and brevis and is separated from the extensor brevis pollicis by a triangular interval in which the radial artery is found and is finally inserted into the base of the last phalanx of the thumb. 
The radial artery is crossed by the tendons of the abductor pollicis longus and of the extensoris pollicis longus and brevis. The extensor indices proprius, extensor indices, is a narrow, elongated muscle placed medial to and parallel with the preceding. It arises from the dorsal surface of the body of the ulna below the origin of the extensor pollicis longus and from the interosseous membrane. Its tendon passes under the dorsal carpal ligament in the same compartment as that which transmits the tendons of the extensor digitorum communis and opposite the head of the second metacarpal bone joins the ulnar side of the tendon of the extensor digitorum communis, which belongs to the index finger. Variations Doubling The ulnar part may pass beneath the dorsal carpal ligament with the extensor digitorum communis. A slip from the tendon may pass to the index finger. Nerves The brachioradialis is supplied by the fifth and sixth. The extensoris carpi radialis longus and brevis by the sixth and seventh, and the anconeus by the seventh and eighth cervical nerves, through the radial nerve. The remaining muscles are innervated through the deep radial nerve, the supinator being supplied by the sixth, and all the other muscles by the seventh cervical. Actions The muscles of the lateral and dorsal aspects of the forearm, which comprise all the extensor muscles and the supinator, act upon the forearm, wrist, and hand. They are the direct antagonists of the pronator and flexor muscles. The anconeus assists the triceps in extending the forearm. The brachioradialis is a flexor of the elbow joint, but only acts as such when the movement of flexion has been initiated by the biceps brachii and brachialis. The action of the supinator is suggested by its name. It assists the biceps in bringing the hand into the supine position. The extensor carpi radialis longus extends the wrist and abducts the hand. It may also assist in bending the elbow joint. At all events, it serves to fix or steady this articulation. The extensor carpi radialis brevis extends the wrist and may also act slightly as an abductor of the hand. The extensor carpi ulnaris extends the wrist, but when acting alone inclines the hand toward the ulnar side. By its continued action, it extends the elbow joint. The extensor digitorum communis extends the phalanges, then the wrist, and finally the elbow. It acts principally on the proximal phalanges, the middle and terminal phalanges being extended mainly by the interossei and lumbricales. It tends to separate the fingers as it extends them. The extensor digiti quinti proprius extends the little finger and by its continued action assists in extending the wrist. It is owing to this muscle that the little finger can be extended or pointed while the others are flexed. The chief action of the abductor pollicis longus is to carry the thumb laterally from the palm of the hand. By its continued action, it helps to extend and abduct the wrist. The extensor pollicis brevis extends the proximal phalanx, and the extensor pollicis longus, the terminal phalanx of the thumb. By their continued action, they help to extend and abduct the wrist. The extensor indices proprius extends the index finger, and by its continued action, assists in extending the wrist. End of section 47 Recording by Selena Arter. Section 48 of Gray's Anatomy, Part 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Morgan Scorpion. Anatomy of the Human Body, Part 2, by Henry Gray. Muscles and Fasciae of the Hand 1F. The Muscles and Fasciae of the Hand The muscles of the hand are subdivided into three groups. 1. Those of the thumb, which occupy the radial side and produce the thena eminence. 2. Those of the little finger, which occupy the ulnar side and give rise to the hypothena eminence. 3. 
those in the middle of the palm and between the metacarpal bones. Volar carpal ligament, ligamentum carpi volare. The volar carpal ligament is the thickened band of the antibrachial fascia which extends from the radius to the ulna over the flexor tendons as they enter the wrist. Transverse carpal ligament. Ligamentum carpi transversum, anterior annular ligament. The transverse carpal ligament is a strong fibrous band which arches over the carpus, converting the deep groove on the front of the carpal bones into a tunnel, through which the flexor tendons of the digits and the median nerve pass. It is attached medially to the pisiform and the hamulus of the hamate bones, laterally to the tuberosity of the navicular, and to the medial part of the volar surface and the ridge of the greater multangula. It is continuous, above, with the volar carpal ligament, and below, with the palmar aponeurosis. It is crossed by the ulnar vessels and nerve, and the cutaneous branches of the median and ulnar nerves. At its lateral end is the tendon of the flexor carpi radialis, which lies in the groove on the greater multangular between the attachments of the ligament to the bone. On its volar surface, the tendons of the palmaris longus and flexor carpi ulnaris are partially inserted. Below, it gives origin to the short muscles of the thumb and little finger. The mucus sheaths of the tendons on the front of the wrist. Two sheaths envelop the tendons as they pass beneath the transverse carpal ligament, one for the flexoris digitorum sublimis and profundis, and the other for the flexor pollicis longus. They extend into the forearm for about 2.5 cm above the transverse carpal ligament, and occasionally communicate with each other under the ligament. The sheath which surrounds the flexoris digitorum extends downward about halfway along the metacarpal bones, where it ends in blind diverticula around the tendons to the index, middle and ring fingers. It is prolonged on the tendons to the little finger and usually communicates with the mucus sheath of these tendons. The sheath of the tendon of the flexor pollicis longus is continued along the thumb as far as the insertion of the tendon. The mucus sheaths enveloping the terminal parts of the tendons of the flexoris digitorum have been described on page 449. Dorsal carpal ligament. Ligamentum carpi dorsali. Posterior annular ligament. The dorsal carpal ligament is a strong fibrous band extending obliquely downward and medialward across the back of the wrist and consisting of part of the deep fascia of the back of the forearm, strengthened by the addition of some transverse fibres. It is attached medially to the styloid process of the ulna and to the triangular and pisiform bones, laterally to the lateral margin of the radius, and, in its passage across the wrist, to the ridges on the dorsal surface of the radius. The mucus sheaths of the tendons on the back of the wrist. Between the dorsal carpal ligament and the bones, six compartments are formed for the passage of tendons, each compartment having a separate mucus sheath. One is found in each of the following positions. 1. On the lateral side of the styloid process, for the tendons of the abductor pollicis longus and the extensor pollicis brevis. 2. Behind the styloid process, for the tendons of the extensores carpi radialis longus and brevis. 3. About the middle of the dorsal surface of the radius, for the tendon of the extensor pollicis longus. 4. To the medial side of the latter, for the tendons of the extensor digitorum communis and extensor indicus proprius. 5. Opposite the interval between the radius and ulna, for the extensor digiti quinti proprius. 6. Between the head and styloid process of the ulna, for the tendon of the extensor carpi ulnaris. The sheaths lining these compartments extends from above the dorsal carpal ligament, those for the tendons of abductor pollicis longus, extensor brevis pollicis, extensoris carpi radialis, and extensor carpi ulnaris stop immediately proximal to the basis of the metacarpal bones, while the sheaths for extensor communis digitorum, extensor indicus proprius, and extensor digiti quinti proprius are prolonged to the junction of the proximal and intermediate thirds of the metacarpus. Palmar aponeurosis, aponeurosis palmaris. Palma fascia. The palmar aponeurosis invests the muscles of the palm and consists of central, lateral, and medial portions. The central portion occupies the middle of the palm, 
is triangular in shape and of great strength and thickness. Its apex is continuous with the lower margin of the transverse carpal ligament and receives the expanded tendon of the pulmaris longus. Its base divides below into four slips, one for each finger. Each slip gives off superficial fibers to the skin of the palm and finger, those to the palm joining the skin at the furrow corresponding to the metacarpophalangeal articulations, and those to the fingers passing into the skin at the transverse fold at the bases of the fingers. The deeper part of each slip subdivides into two processes, which are inserted into the fibrous sheaths of the flexor tendons. From the sides of these processes, offsets are attached to the transverse metacarpal ligament. By this arrangement, short channels are formed on the front of the heads of the metacarpal bones. Through these, the flexor tendons pass. The intervals between the four slips transmit the digital vessels and nerves and the tendons of the lumbricales. At the points of division into the slips mentioned, numerous strong transverse fasciculi bind the separate processes together. The central part of the palmar aponeurosis is intimately bound to the integument by dense fibroareolar tissue forming the superficial palmar fascia, and gives origin by its medial margin to the palmaris brevis. It covers the superficial volar arch, the tendons of the flexor muscles, and the branches of the median and ulnar nerves and on either side it gives off a septum, which is continuous with the interosseous aponeurosis, and separates the intermediate from the collateral groups of muscles. The lateral and medial portions of the palmar aponeurosis are thin, fibrous layers, which cover, on the radial side, the muscles of the ball of the thumb, and on the ulnar side, the muscles of the little finger. They are continuous with the central portion and with the fascia on the dorsum of the hand. The superficial transverse ligament of the fingers is a thin band of transverse fasciculi. It stretches across the roots of the four fingers and is closely attached to the skin of the clefts and medially to the fifth metacarpal bone, forming a sort of rudimentary web. Beneath it, the digital vessels and nerves pass to their destinations. The lateral volar muscles Abductor pollicis brevis Flexor pollicis brevis Opponens pollicis Adductor pollicis obliquus, adductor pollicis transversus. The abductor pollicis brevis, abductor pollicis, is a thin, flat muscle placed immediately beneath the integument. It arises from the transverse carpal ligament, the tuberosity of the navicular, and the ridge of the greater multangular, frequently by two distinct slips. Running lateralward and downward, it is inserted by a thin, flat tendon into the radial side of the base of the first phalanx of the thumb and the capsule of the metacarpophalangeal articulation. The opponent's pollicis is a small, triangular muscle placed beneath the preceding. It arises from the ridge on the greater multangular and from the transverse carpal ligament, passes downward and lateralward, and is inserted into the whole length of the metacarpal bone of the thumb on its radial side. The flexor pollicis brevis consists of two portions, lateral and medial. The lateral and more superficial portion arises from the lower border of the transverse carpal ligament and the lower part of the ridge on the greater multangular bone. It passes along the radial side of the tendon of the flexor pollicis longus and, becoming tendinous, is inserted into the radial side of the base of the first phalanx of the thumb. In its tendon of insertion there is a sesamoid bone. The medial and deeper portion of the muscle is very small and arises from the ulnar side of the first metacarpal bone between the adductor pollicis obliquus and the lateral head of the first interosseus dorsalis and is inserted into the ulnar side of the base of the first phalanx with the adductor pollicis obliquus. The medial part of the flexor brevis pollicis is sometimes described as the first interosseus volaris. The adductor pollicus obliquus adductor obliquus pollicis, arises by several slips from the capitate bone. The bases of the second and third metacarpals, the intercarpal ligaments, and the sheath of the tendon of the flexor carpi radialis. From this origin, the greater number of fibers pass obliquely downward and converge to a tendon, which, uniting with the tendons of the medial portion of the flexor pollicis brevis and the transverse part of the adductor, is inserted into the ulnar side of the base of the first phalanx of the thumb a sesamoid bone being present in the tendon. A considerable fasciculus, however, 
passes more obliquely beneath the tendon of the flexor pollicis longus to join the lateral portion of the flexor brevis and the abductor pollicis brevis. The adductor pollicis transversus, adductor transversus pollicis, is the most deeply seated of this group of muscles. It is of a triangular form arising by a broad base from the lower two-thirds of the volar surface of the third metacarpal bone. The fibres converge to be inserted with the medial part of the flexor pollicis brevis and the adductor pollicis obliquus into the ulnar side of the base of the first phalanx of the thumb. Variations The abductor pollicis brevis is often divided into an outer and an inner part. Accessory slips from the tendon of the abductor pollicis longus or palmaris longus, more rarely from the extensor carpi radialis longus, from the styloid process or opponens pollicis, or from the skin over the thena eminence. The deep head of the flexor pollicis brevis may be absent or enlarged. The two adductors vary in their relative extent and in the closeness of their connection. The adductor obliquus may receive a slip from the transverse metacarpal ligament. Nerves the abductor brevis, opponens, and lateral head of the flexor pollicis brevis are supplied by the sixth and seventh cervical nerves through the median nerve, the medial head of the flexor brevis, and the adductor by the eighth cervical through the ulnar nerve. Actions The abductor pollicis brevis draws the thumb forward in a plane at right angles to that of the palm of the hand. The adductor pollicis is the opponent of this muscle and approximates the thumb to the palm. The opponent's pollicis flexes the metacarpal bone, i.e., draws it medialward over the palm. The flexor pollicis brevis flexes and adducts the proximal phalanx. 2. The medial volar muscles. Palmaris brevis. Abductor digiti quinti. Flexor digiti quinti brevis. Opponent's digiti quinti. The palmaris brevis is a thin quadrilateral muscle placed beneath the integument of the ulnar side of the hand. It arises by tenderness fasciculi from the transverse carpal ligament and palmar aponeurosis. The fleshy fibres are inserted into the skin on the ulnar border of the palm of the hand. The abductor digiti quinti, abductor minimi digiti, is situated on the ulnar border of the palm of the hand. It arises from the pisiform bone, and from the tendon of the flexor carpi ulnaris, and ends in a flat tendon, which divides into two slips. One is inserted into the ulnar side of the base of the first phalanx of the little finger, the other into the ulnar border of the upper neurosis of the extensor digiti quinti proprius. The flexor digiti quinti brevis, flexor brevis minimi digiti, lies on the same plane as the preceding muscle, on its radial side. It arises from the convex surface of the hamulus of the hamate bone, and the volar surface of the transverse carpal ligament, and is inserted into the ulnar side of the base of the first phalanx of the little finger. It is separated from the abductor, at its origin, by the deep branches of the ulnar artery and nerve. This muscle is sometimes wanting. The abductor is then, usually, of large size. The opponens digiti quinti, opponens minimi digiti, is of a triangular form, and placed immediately beneath the preceding muscles. It arises from the convexity of the hamulus of the hamate bone and contiguous portion of the transverse carpal ligament. It is inserted into the whole length of the metacarpal bone of the little finger, along its ulnar margin. Variations The palmaris brevis varies greatly in size. The abductor digiti quinti may be divided into two or three slips, or united with the flexor digiti quinti brevis. Accessory head from the tendon of the flexor carpi ulnaris the transverse carpal ligament, the fascia of the forearm or the tendon of the palmaris longus. A portion of the muscle may insert into the metacarpal or separate slips of the pisimetacarpus, pisiancinatus, or the pisiannularis muscle may exist. Nerves. All the muscles of this group are supplied by the eighth cervical nerve through the ulnar nerve. Actions. The abductor and flexor digiti quinti brevis abduct the little finger from the ring finger and assist in flexing the proximal phalanx. The opponent's digiti quinti draws forward the fifth metacarpal bone so as to deepen the hollow of the palm. The palmaris brevis corrugates the skin on the ulnar side of the palm. 3. The intermediate muscles. Lumbricalis interossi. The lumbricales are four small fleshy fasciculi associated with the tendons of the flexor digitorum profundus. 
the first and second arise from the radial sides and volar surfaces of the tendons of the index and middle fingers respectively the third from the contiguous sides of the tendons of the middle and ring fingers and the fourth from the contiguous sides of the tendons of the ring and little fingers each passes to the radial side of the corresponding finger and opposite the metacarpophalangeal articulation is inserted into the tendinous expansion of the extensor digitorum communis covering the dorsal aspect of the finger variations the lumbricales vary in number from two to five or six and there is considerable variation in insertions the interossi are so named from occupying the intervals between the metacarpal bones and are divided into two sets, a dorsal and a volar. The interossi dorsalis, dorsal interossi, are four in number and occupy the intervals between the metacarpal bones. They are bipeniform muscles, each arising by two heads from the adjacent sides of the metacarpal bones, but more extensively from the metacarpal bone of the finger into which the muscle is inserted. They are inserted into the bases of the first phalanges and into the aponeuroses of the tendons of the extensor digitorum communis. Between the double origin of each of these muscles is a narrow triangular interval. Through the first of these the radial artery passes. Through each of the other three a perforating branch from the deep volar arch is transmitted. The first, or abductor indicus, is larger than the others. It is flat, triangular in form, and arises by two heads, separated by a fibrous arch for the passage of the radial artery from the dorsum to the palm of the hand. The lateral head arises from the proximal half of the ulnar border of the first metacarpal bone. The medial head, from almost the entire length of the radial border of the second metacarpal bone, the tendon is inserted into the radial side of the index finger. The second and third are inserted into the middle finger, the former into its radial, the latter into its ulnar side. The fourth is inserted into the ulnar side of the ring finger. The interossi volares, palmar interossi, three in number, are smaller than the interossi dorsales and placed upon the volar surfaces of the metacarpal bones rather than between them. Each arises from the entire length of the metacarpal bone of one finger and is inserted into the side of the base of the first phalanx and aponeurotic expansion of the extensor communis tendon to the same finger. The first arises from the ulnar side of the second metacarpal bone and is inserted into the same side of the first phalanx of the index finger. The second arises from the radial side of the fourth metacarpal bone and is inserted into the same side of the ring finger. The third arises from the radial side of the fifth metacarpal bone and is inserted into the same side of the little finger. From this account it may be seen that each finger is provided with two interossi, with the exception of the little finger in which the abductor takes the place of one of the pair. As already mentioned, the medial head of the flexor pollicis previs is sometimes described as the interosseus volaris primus. Nerves. The two lateral lumbricales are supplied by the sixth and seventh cervical nerves. Through the third and fourth digital branches of the median nerve, the two medial lumbricales and all the interossi are supplied by the eighth cervical nerve through the deep palmar branch of the ulnar nerve. The third lumbricalis frequently receives a twig from the median. Actions. The interossi volaris adduct the fingers to an imaginary line drawn longitudinally through the centre of the middle finger, and the interossi dorsalis abduct the fingers from that line. In addition to this, the interossi, in conjunction with the lumbricalis, flex the first phalanges at the metacarpophalangeal joints, and extend the second and third phalanges in consequence of their insertions into the expansions of the extensor tendons. The extensor digitorum communis is believed to act almost entirely on the first phalanges. End of section number 48section number 49 of gray's anatomy part 2 this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by morgan scorpion anatomy of the human body part 2 by henry gray muscles and fasciae of the iliac region the muscles of the lower extremity are subdivided into groups corresponding with the different regions of the limb. 1. Muscles of the iliac region. 2. 
muscles of the thigh, three, muscles of the leg, four, muscles of the foot. The muscles and fasciae of the iliac region, psoas major, psoas minor, iliacus. The fascia covering the psoas and iliacus is thin above, and becomes gradually thicker below as it approaches the inguinal ligament. The portion covering the psoas is thickened above to form the medial lumbar costal arch, which stretches from the transverse process of the first lumbar vertebra to the body of the second. Medially, it is attached by a series of arched processes to the intervertebral fibre cartilages and prominent margins of the bodies of the vertebrae, and to the upper part of the sacrum. The intervals left, opposite the constricted portions of the bodies, transmit the lumbar arteries and veins and filaments of the sympathetic trunk. Laterally, above the crest of the ilium, it is continuous with the fascia covering the front of the quadratus lumborum, while below the crest of the ilium it is continuous with the fascia covering the iliacus. The portions investing the iliacus, fascia iliaca, iliac fascia, is connected, laterally, to the whole length of the inner lip of the iliac crest, and medially to the linear terminalis of the lesser pelvis, where it is continuous with the periosteum. At the iliopectineal eminence it receives the tendon of insertion of the psoas minor when that muscle exists. Lateral to the femoral vessels it is intimately connected to the posterior margin of the inguinal ligament, and is continuous with the transversalis fascia. Immediately lateral to the femoral vessels the iliac fascia is prolonged backward and medialward from the inguinal ligament as a band, the iliopectineal fascia, which is attached to the iliopectineal eminence. This fascia divides the space between the inguinal ligament and the hip bone into two lacunae or compartments, the medial of which transmits the femoral vessels, the lateral the psoas major and iliacus and the femoral nerve. Medial to the vessels the iliac fascia is attached to the pectineal line behind the inguinal aponeurotic fox, where it is again continuous with the transversalis fascia. On the thigh the fascia of the iliacus and psoas form a single sheet termed the iliopectineal fascia. Where the external iliac vessels pass into the thigh, the fascia descends behind them, forming the posterior wall of the femoral sheath. The portion of the iliopectineal fascia which passes behind the femoral vessels is also attached to the pectineal line beyond the limits of the attachment of the inguinal aponeurotic fox. At this part it is continuous with the pectineal fascia. The external iliac vessels lie in front of the iliac fascia, but all the branches of the lumbar plexus are behind it, it is separated from the peritoneum by a quantity of loose areolar tissue. The psoas major, psoas magnus, is a long fusiform muscle placed on the side of the lumbar region of the vertebral column and brim of the lesser pelvis. It arises, one, from the anterior surfaces of the bases and lower borders of the transverse processes of all the lumbar vertebra. Two, from the sides of the bodies and the corresponding intervertebral fibre cartilages of the last thoracic and all the lumbar vertebrae by five slips, each of which is attached to the adjacent upper and lower margins of two vertebrae, and to the intervertebral fibre cartilage. 3. From a series of tenderness arches which extend across the constricted parts of the bodies of the lumbar vertebrae between the previous slips, the lumbar arteries and veins, and filaments from the sympathetic trunk pass beneath these tenderness arches. The muscle proceeds downward across the brim of the lesser pelvis, and diminishing gradually in size, passes beneath the inguinal ligament and in front of the capsule of the hip joint and ends in a tendon. The tendon receives nearly the whole of the fibres of the iliacus and is inserted into the lesser trochanter of the femur. A large bursa which may communicate with the cavity of the hip joint separates the tendon from the pubis and the capsule of the joint. The psoas minor, psoas parvus is a long slender muscle, placed in front of the psoas major. It arises from the sides of the bodies of the twelfth thoracic and first lumbar vertebra, and from the fibre cartilage between them. It ends in a long flat tendon which is inserted into the pectineal line and iliopectineal eminence, and, by its lateral border, into the iliac fascia. This muscle is often absent. The iliacus is a flat, triangular muscle which fills the iliac fossa. It arises from the upper two-thirds of this fossa, and from the inner lip of the iliac crest, behind, from the anterior sacroiliac and the iliolumbar ligaments, and base of the sacrum. In front, it reaches as far as the anterior superior and anterior inferior iliac spines, and the notch between them. 
the fibres converge to be inserted into the lateral side of the tendon of the psoas major some of them being prolonged on the body of the femur for about two point five centimetres below and in front of the lesser trochanter note eighty five the psoas major and iliacus are sometimes regarded as a single muscle named the iliopsoas end of note eighty five variations the iliacus minor or iliocapsularis a small detached part of the iliacus is frequently present it arises from the anterior inferior spine of the ilium and is inserted into the lower part of the intertrochanteric line of the femur or into the iliofemoral ligament nerves the psoas major is supplied by branches of the second and third lumbar nerve the psoas minor by a branch of the first lumbar nerve and the iliacus by branches of the second and third lumbar nerves through the femoral nerve actions the psoas major acting from above flexes the thigh upon the pelvis being assisted by the iliacus acting from below with the femur fixed it bends the lumbar portion of the vertebral column forward and to its own side and then in conjunction with the iliacus tilts the pelvis forward when the muscles of both sides are acting from below they serve to maintain the erect posture by supporting the vertebral column and pelvis upon the femora or in continued action bend the trunk and pelvis forward as in raising the trunk from the recumbent posture the psoas minor is a tensor of the iliac fascia end of section number forty nine Section 50 of Gray's Anatomy, Part 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Anatomy of the Human Body, Part 2, by Henry Gray. The Muscles and Fasci of the Thigh, Part 1. 1. The Anterior Femoral Muscles. Sartorius. Quadriceps Femoris rectus femoris vastus lateralis vastus medialis vastus intermedius articularis genu superficial fascia the superficial fascia forms a continuous layer over the whole of the thigh it consists of areolar tissue containing in its meshes much fat and may be separated into two or more layers between which are found the superficial vessels and nerves. It varies in thickness in different parts of the limb. In the groin it is thick, and the two layers are separated from one another by the superficial inguinal lymph glands, the great saphenous vein, and several smaller vessels. The superficial layer is continuous above with the superficial fascia of the abdomen. The deep layer of the superficial fascia is a very thin, fibrous stratum, best marked on the medial side of the great saphenous vein and below the inguinal ligament. It is placed beneath the subcutaneous vessels and nerves and upon the surface of the fasciolata. It is intimately adherent to the fasciolata a little below the inguinal ligament. It covers the fossa ovalis, saphenous opening being closely united to its circumference and is connected to the sheath of the femoral vessels the portion of fascia covering this fossa is perforated by the great saphenous vein and by numerous blood and lymphatic vessels hence it has been termed the fascia cribrosa the openings for these vessels having been likened to the holes in a sieve a large subcutaneous bursa is found in the superficial fascia over the patella deep fascia the deep fascia of the thigh is named, from its great extent, the fascia lata. It constitutes an investment for the whole of this region of the limb, but varies in thickness in different parts. Thus it is thicker in the upper and lateral part of the thigh, where it receives a fibrous expansion from the gluteus maximus, and where the tensor fasciolati is inserted between its layers. It is very thin behind and at the upper and medial part, where it covers the adductor muscles and again becomes stronger around the knee, receiving fibrous expansions from the tendon of the biceps femoris laterally, from the sartorius medially, and from the quadriceps femoris in front. The fascia lata is attached, above and behind, to the back of the sacrum and cossacks, laterally to the iliac crest, in front to the inguinal ligament, 
and to the superior ramus of the pubis and medially to the inferior ramus of the pubis to the inferior ramus and tuberosity of the ischium and to the lower border of the sacrotuberous ligament from its attachment to the iliac crest it passes down over the gluteus medius to the upper border of the gluteus maximus where it splits into two layers one passing superficial to and the other beneath this muscle at the lower border of the muscle the two layers reunite laterally the fascia lata receives the greater part of the tendon of insertion of the gluteus maximus and becomes proportionately thickened the portion of the fascia lata attached to the front part of the iliac crest and corresponding to the origin of the tensor fasciae extends down the lateral side of the thigh as two layers one superficial to and the other beneath this muscle at the lower end of the muscle these two layers unite and form a strong band having first received the insertion of the muscle this band is continued downward under the name of the iliotibial band tractus iliotibialis and is attached to the lateral condyle of the tibia the part of the iliotibial band which lies beneath the tensor fasciae is prolonged upward to join the lateral part of the capsule of the hip joint below the fascia lata is attached to all the prominent points around the knee joint viz the condyles of the femur and tibia and the head of the fibula on either side of the patella it is strengthened by transverse fibers from the lower parts of the vasti which are attached to and support this bone of these the lateral are the stronger and are continuous with the iliotibial band the deep surface of the fascia lata gives off two strong intermuscular septa which are attached to the whole length of the linea aspera and its prolongations above and below the lateral and stronger one which extends from the insertion of the gluteus maximus to the lateral condyle separates the vastus lateralis in front from the short head of the biceps femoris behind and gives partial origin to these muscles the medial and thinner one separates the vastus medialis from the adductores and pectineus besides these there are numerous smaller septa separating the individual muscles and enclosing each in a distinct sheath the fossa ovalis saphenous opening at the upper and medial part of the thigh a little below the medial end of the inguinal ligament is a large oval-shaped aperture in the fascia lata it transmits the great saphenous vein and other smaller vessels and is termed the fossa ovalis the fascia cribrosa which is pierced by the structures passing through the opening closes the aperture and must be removed to expose it the fascia lata in this part of the thigh is described as consisting of a superficial and a deep portion the superficial portion of the fascia lata is the part on the lateral side of the fossa ovalis it is attached laterally to the crest and anterior superior spine of the ilium to the whole length of the inguinal ligament and to the pectineal line in conjunction with the lacunar ligament from the tubercle of the pubis it is reflected downward and lateralward as an arched margin the fossiform margin forming the lateral boundary of the fossa ovalis this margin overlies and is adherent to the anterior layer of the sheath of the femoral vessels to its edge is attached the fascia cribrosa the upward and medial prolongation of the falciform margin is named the superior cornu its downward and medial prolongation the inferior cornu the latter is well defined and is continuous behind the great saphenous vein with the pectineal fascia the deep portion is situated on the medial side of the fossa ovalis and at the lower margin of the fossa is continuous with the superficial portion traced upward it covers the pectineus adductor longus and gracilis and passing behind the sheath of the femoral vessels to which it is closely united is continuous with the iliopectineal fascia and is attached to the pectineal line from this description it may be observed that the superficial portion of the fascia lata lies in front of the femoral vessels and the deep portion behind them so that an apparent aperture exists between the two through which 
the great saphenous passes to join the femoral vein the sartorius the longest muscle in the body is narrow and ribbon-like it arises by tendinous fibres from the anterior superior iliac spine and the upper half of the notch below it it passes obliquely across the upper and anterior part of the thigh from the lateral to the medial side of the limb then descends vertically as far as the medial side of the knee passing behind the medial condyle of the femur to end in a tendon this curves obliquely forward and expands into a broad aponeurosis which is inserted in front of the gracilis and semitendinous into the upper part of the medial surface of the body of the tibia nearly as far forward as the anterior crest the upper part of the aponeurosis is curved backward over the upper edge of the tendon of the gracilis so as to be inserted behind it an offset from its upper margin blends with the capsule of the knee joint and another from its lower border with the fascia on the medial side of the leg variations slips of origin from the outer end of the inguinal ligament the notch of the ilium the iliopectineal line or the pubis occur the muscle may be split into two parts and one part may be inserted into the fascia lata the femur the ligament of the patella or the tendon of the semitendinosus the tendon of insertion may end in the fascia lata the capsule of the knee joint or the fascia of the leg the muscle may be absent the quadriceps femoris quadriceps extensor includes the four remaining muscles on the front of the thigh it is the great extensor muscle of the leg forming a large fleshy mass which covers the front and sides of the femur it is subdivided into separate portions which have received distinctive names one occupying the middle of the thigh and connected above with the ilium is called from its straight course the rectus femoris the other three lie in immediate connection with the body of the femur which they cover from the trochanters to the condyles the portion on the lateral side of the femur is termed the vastus lateralis that covering the medial side the vastus medialis and that in front the vastus intermedius the rectus femoris is situated in the middle of the front of the thigh it is fusiform in shape and its superficial fibres are arranged in a bipeniform manner the deep fibres running straight down to the deep aponeurosis it arises by two tendons one the anterior or straight from the anterior inferior iliac spine the other the posterior or reflected from a groove above the brim of the acetabulum the two unite at an acute angle and spread into an aponeurosis which is prolonged downward on the anterior surface of the muscle and from this the muscular fibres arise the muscle ends in a broad and thick aponeurosis which occupies the lower two-thirds of its posterior surface and gradually becoming narrowed into a flattened tendon is inserted into the base of the patella the vastus lateralis vastus externus is the largest part of the quadriceps femoris it arises by a broad aponeurosis which is attached to the upper part of the intertrochanteric line to the anterior and inferior borders of the greater trochanter to the lateral lip of the gluteal tuberosity and to the upper half of the lateral lip of the linea aspera this aponeurosis covers the upper three-fourths of the muscle and from its deep surface many fibres take origin a few additional fibres arise from the tendon of the gluteus maximus and from the lateral intramuscular septum between the vastus lateralis and short head of the biceps femoris the fibres form a large fleshy mass which is attached to a strong aponeurosis placed on the deep surface of the lower part of the muscle this aponeurosis becomes contracted and thickened into a flat tendon inserted into the lateral border of the patella blending with the quadriceps femoris tendon and giving an expansion to the capsule of the knee joint the vastus medialis and vastus intermedius appear to be inseparably united but when the rectus femoris has been reflected a narrow interval will be observed extending upward from the medial border of the patella 
between the two muscles and the separation may be continued as far as the lower part of the intertrochanteric line where however the two muscles are frequently continuous the vastus medialis vastus internus arises from the lower half of the intertrochanteric line the medial lip of the linea aspera the upper part of the medial supracondylar line the tendons of the adductor longus and the adductor magnus and the medial intermuscular septum its fibers are directed downward and forward and are chiefly attached to an aponeurosis which lies on the deep surface of the muscle and is inserted into the medial border of the patella and the quadriceps femoris tendon an expansion being sent to the capsule of the knee joint the vastus intermedius crorius arises from the front and lateral surfaces of the body of the femur in its upper two-thirds and from the lower part of the lateral intermuscular septum its fibers end in a superficial aponeurosis which forms the deep part of the quadriceps femoris tendon the tendons of the different portions of the quadriceps unite at the lower part of the thigh so as to form a single strong tendon which is inserted into the base of the patella some few fibers passing over it to blend with the ligamentum patelli more properly the patella may be regarded as a sesamoid bone developed in the tendon of the quadriceps and the ligamentum patelli which is continued from the apex of the patella to the tuberosity of the tibia as the proper tendon of insertion of the muscle the medial and lateral patellar retinacula being expansions from its borders a bursa which usually communicates with the cavity of the knee joint is situated between the femur and the portion of the quadriceps tendon above the patella another is interposed between the tendon and the upper part of the front of the tibia and a third the prepatellar bursa is placed over the patella itself the articularis genu subcroreus is a small muscle usually distinct from the vastus intermedius but occasionally blended with it it arises from the anterior surface of the lower part of the body of the femur and is inserted into the upper part of the synovial membrane of the knee joint it sometimes consists of several separate muscular bundles nerves the muscles of this region are supplied by the second third and fourth lumbar nerves through the femoral nerve actions the sartorius flexes the leg upon the thigh and continuing to act flexes the thigh upon the pelvis this it next abducts and rotates the thigh outward when the knee is bent the sartorius assists the semitendinosus semimembranosus and popliteus in rotating the tibia inward taking its fixed point from the leg it flexes the pelvis upon the thigh and if one muscle acts assists in rotating the pelvis the quadriceps femoris extends the leg upon the thigh the rectus femoris assists the psoas major and iliacus in supporting the pelvis and trunk upon the femur it also assists in flexing the thigh on the pelvis or if the thigh be fixed it will flex the pelvis the vastus medialis draws the patella medial ward as well as upward two the medial femoral muscles gracilis pectineus adductor longus adductor brevis adductor magnus the gracilis is the most superficial muscle on the medial side of the thigh it is thin and flattened broad above narrow and tapering below it arises by a thin aponeurosis from the anterior margins of the lower half of the symphysis pubis and the upper half of the pubic arch the fibers run vertically downward and end in a rounded tendon which passes behind the medial condyle of the femur curves around the medial condyle of the tibia where it becomes flattened and is inserted into the upper part of the medial surface of the body of the tibia below the condyle a few of the fibers of the lower part of the tendon are prolonged into the deep fascia of the leg at its insertion the tendon is situated immediately above that of the semitendinosus and its upper edge is overlapped by the tendon of the sartorius with which it is in part blended it is separated from the tibial collateral ligament of the knee joint by a bursa common to it and the tendon of the semitendinosus the pectineus is a flat quadrangular muscle situated at the anterior part of the upper and medial aspect of the thigh 
it arises from the pectineal line and to a slight extent from the surface of bone in front of it between the iliopectineal eminence and tubercle of the pubis and from the fascia covering the anterior surface of the muscle the fibers pass downward backward and lateralward to be inserted into a rough line leading from the lesser trochanter to the linea aspera the adductor longus the most superficial of the three adductories is a triangular muscle lying in the same plane as the pectineus it arises by a flat narrow tendon from the front of the pubis at the angle of junction of the crest with the symphysis and soon expands into a broad fleshy belly this passes downward backward and lateralward and is inserted by an aponeurosis into the linea aspera between the vastus medialis and the adductor magnus with both of which it is usually blended the adductor brevis is situated immediately behind the two preceding muscles it is somewhat triangular in form and arises by a narrow origin from the outer surfaces of the superior and inferior rami of the pubis between the gracilis and obturator externus its fibers passing backward lateralward and downward are inserted by an aponeurosis into the line leading from the lesser trochanter to the linea aspera and into the upper part of the linea aspera immediately behind the pectineus and upper part of the adductor longus the adductor magnus is a large triangular muscle situated on the medial side of the thigh it arises from a small part of the inferior ramus of the pubis from the inferior ramus of the ischium and from the outer margin of the inferior part of the tuberosity of the ischium those fibers which arise from the ramus of the pubis are short horizontal in direction and are inserted into the rough line leading from the greater trochanter to the linea aspera medial to the gluteus maximus those from the ramus of the ischium are directed downward and lateralward with different degrees of obliquity to be inserted by means of a broad aponeurosis into the linea aspera and the upper part of its medial prolongation below the medial portion of the muscle composed principally of the fibers arising from the tuberosity of the ischium forms a thick fleshy mass consisting of coarse bundles which descend almost vertically and end about the lower third of the thigh in a rounded tendon which is inserted into the adductor tubercle on the medial condyle of the femur and is connected by a fibrous expansion to the line leading upward from the tubercle to the linea aspera at the insertion of the muscle there is a series of osseoaponeurotic openings formed by tendinous arches attached to the bone the upper four openings are small and give passage to the perforating branches of the profunda femoris artery the lowest is of large size and transmits the femoral vessels to the popliteal fossa variations the pectineus is sometimes divided into an outer part supplied by the femoral nerve and an inner part supplied by the obturator nerve the muscle may be attached to or inserted into the capsule of the hip joint the adductor longus may be double may extend to the knee or be more or less united with the pectineus the adductor brevis may be divided into two or three parts or it may be united to the adductor magnus the adductor magnus may be more or less segmented the anterior and superior portion is often described as a separate muscle the adductor minimus the muscle may be fused with the quadratus femoris nerves the three adductories and the gracilis are supplied by the third and fourth lumbar nerves through the obturator nerve the adductor magnus receiving an additional branch from the sacral plexus through the sciatic the pectineus is supplied by the second third and fourth lumbar nerves through the femoral nerve and by the third lumbar through the accessory obturator when this latter exists occasionally it receives a branch from the obturator nerve note eighty six the pectineus may consist of two incompletely separated strata the lateral or dorsal stratum which is constant is supplied by a branch from the femoral nerve or in the absence of this branch by the accessory obturator nerve the medial or ventral stratum when present is supplied by the obturator nerve a m patterson journal of anatomy and physiology twenty six forty three actions the pectineus and three adductories adduct the thigh powerfully 
They are especially used in horse exercise, the size of the saddle being grasped between the knees by the contraction of these muscles. In consequence of the obliquity of their insertions into the linea aspera, they rotate the thigh outward, assisting the external rotators, and when the limb has been abducted, they draw it medialward, carrying the thigh across that of the opposite side. The pectineus and adductoris brevis and longus assist the psoas major and iliacus in flexing the thigh upon the pelvis. In progression, all these muscles assist in drawing forward the lower limb. The gracilis assists the sartorius in flexing the leg and rotating it inward. It is also an adductor of the thigh. If the lower extremities be fixed, these muscles, taking their fixed points below, may act upon the pelvis, serving to maintain the body in an erect posture, or, if their action be continued, flex the pelvis forward upon the femur. End of section 50. Recording by Selena Arter. Section 51 of Gray's Anatomy, Part 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Anatomy of the Human Body, Part 2, by Henry Gray. The Muscles and Fasci of the Thigh, Part 2. 3. The Muscles of the Gluteal Region. Gluteus Maximus. Gluteus Medius. Gluteus Minimus. Tensor fasci lati, piriformis, obturator internus, gemellus superior, gemellus inferior, quadratus femoris, obturator externus. The gluteus maximus, the most superficial muscle in the gluteal region, is a broad and thick fleshy mass of a quadrilateral shape, and forms the prominence of the nates. Its large size is one of the most characteristic features of the muscular system in man connected as it is with the power he has of maintaining the trunk in the erect posture. The muscle is remarkably coarse in structure, being made up of fasciculi lying parallel with one another and collected together into large bundles separated by fibrous septa. It arises from the posterior gluteal line of the ilium and the rough portion of bone including the crest immediately above and behind it from the posterior surface of the lower part of the sacrum and the side of the cossacks, from the aponeurosis of the sacrospinalis, the sacrotuberous ligament, and the fascia, gluteal aponeurosis, covering the gluteus medius. The fibers are directed obliquely downward and lateralward, those forming the upper and larger portion of the muscle, together with the superficial fibers of the lower portion, end in a thick tendinous lamina, which passes across the greater trochanter and is inserted into the iliotibial band of the fascia lata. The deeper fibers of the lower portion of the muscle are inserted into the gluteal tuberosity between the vastus lateralis and adductor magnus. Bursi. Three bursi are usually found in relation with the deep surface of this muscle. One of these, of large size and generally multilocular, separates it from the greater trochanter. A second, often wanting, is situated on the tuberosity of the ischium. A third is found between the tendon of the muscle and that of the vastus lateralis. The gluteus medius is a broad, thick, radiating muscle situated on the outer surface of the pelvis. Its posterior third is covered by the gluteus maximus, its anterior two-thirds by the gluteal aponeurosis, which separates it from the superficial fascia and integument. It arises from the outer surface of the ilium between the iliac crest and posterior gluteal line above, and the anterior gluteal line below. It also arises from the gluteal aponeurosis, covering its outer surface. The fibers converge to a strong, flattened tendon, which is inserted into the oblique ridge which runs downward and forward on the lateral surface of the greater trochanter. A bursa separates the tendon of the muscle from the surface of the trochanter over which it glides. Variations. The posterior border may be more or less closely united to the piriformis where some of the fibers end on its tendon. The gluteus minimus, the smallest of the three glutei, is placed immediately beneath the preceding. It is fan-shaped, arising from the outer surface of the ilium between the anterior and inferior gluteal lines, and behind, from the margin of the greater sciatic notch. 
The fibers converge to the deep surface of a radiated aponeurosis, and this ends in a tendon which is inserted into an impression on the anterior border of the greater trochanter, and gives an expansion to the capsule of the hip joint. A bursa is interposed between the tendon and the greater trochanter. Between the gluteus medius and gluteus minimus are the deep branches of the superior gluteal vessels and the superior gluteal nerve. The deep surface of the gluteus minimus is in relation with the reflected tendon of the rectus femoris and the capsule of the hip joint. Variations The muscle may be divided into an anterior and a posterior part or it may send slips to the piriformis, the gemellus superior, or the outer part of the origin of the vastus lateralis. The tensor fasci lati, tensor fasci femoris, arises from the anterior part of the outer lip of the iliac crest, from the outer surface of the anterior superior iliac spine, and part of the outer border of the notch below it, between the gluteus medius and sartorius, and from the deep surface of the fascia lata. It is inserted between the two layers of the iliotibial band of the fascia lata about the junction of the middle and upper thirds of the thigh. The piriformis is a flat muscle, pyramidal in shape, lying almost parallel with the posterior margin of the gluteus medius. It is situated partly within the pelvis against its posterior wall and partly at the back of the hip joint. It arises from the front of the sacrum by three fleshy digitations attached to the portions of bone between the first, second, third, and fourth anterior sacral foramina and to the grooves leading from the foramina. A few fibers also arise from the margin of the greater sciatic foramen and from the anterior surface of the sacrotuberous ligament. The muscle passes out of the pelvis through the greater sciatic foramen, the upper part of which it fills, and is inserted by a rounded tendon into the upper border of the greater trochanter behind, but often partly blended with the common tendon of the obturator internus and gemelli. Variations It is frequently pierced by the common peroneal nerve, and thus divided more or less into two parts. It may be united with the gluteus medius, or send fibers to the gluteus minimus, or receive fibers from the gemellus superior. It may have only one or two sacral attachments, or be inserted into the capsule of the hip joint. It may be absent. Obturator Membrane The obturator membrane is a thin fibrous sheet, which almost completely closes the obturator foramen. Its fibers are arranged in interlacing bundles mainly transverse in direction. The uppermost bundle is attached to the obturator tubercles and completes the obturator canal for the passage of the obturator vessels and nerve. The membrane is attached to the sharp margin of the obturator foramen except at its lower lateral angle, where it is fixed to the pelvic surface of the inferior ramus of the ischium, i.e. within the margin. Both obturator muscles are connected with this membrane. The obturator internus is situated partly within the lesser pelvis and partly at the back of the hip joint. It arises from the inner surface of the anterolateral wall of the pelvis, where it surrounds the greater part of the obturator foramen, being attached to the inferior rami of the pubis and ischium, and at the side to the inner surface of the hip bone, below and behind the pelvic brim, reaching from the upper part of the greater sciatic foramen above and behind to the obturator foramen below and in front. It also arises from the pelvic surface of the obturator membrane except in the posterior part, from the tendinous arch which completes the canal for the passage of the obturator vessels and nerve, and to a slight extent from the obturator fascia, which covers the muscle. The fibers converge rapidly toward the lesser sciatic foramen, and end in four or five tendinous bands, which are found on the deep surface of the muscle. These bands are reflected at a right angle over the grooved surface of the ischium between its spine and tuberosity. This bony surface is covered by smooth cartilage, which is separated from the tendon by a bursa, and presents one or more ridges corresponding with the furrows between the tendinous bands. These bands leave the pelvis through the lesser sciatic foramen and unite into a single flattened tendon, which passes horizontally across the capsule of the hip joint, and after receiving the attachments of the gemelli, is inserted into the forepart of the medial surface of the greater trochanter above the trochanteric fossa. 
a bursa narrow and elongated in form is usually found between the tendon and the capsule of the hip joint it occasionally communicates with the bursa between the tendon and the ischium the gemelli are two small muscular fasciculi accessories to the tendon of the obturator internus which is received into a groove between them the gemellus superior the smaller of the two arises from the outer surface of the spine of the ischium blends with the upper part of the tendon of the obturator internus and is inserted with it into the medial surface of the greater trochanter it is sometimes wanting the gemellus inferior arises from the upper part of the tuberosity of the ischium immediately below the groove for the obturator internus tendon it blends with the lower part of the tendon of the obturator internus and is inserted with it into the medial surface of the greater trochanter rarely absent the quadratus femoris is a flat quadrilateral muscle between the gemellus inferior and the upper margin of the adductor magnus it is separated from the latter by the terminal branches of the medial femoral circumflex vessels it arises from the upper part of the external border of the tuberosity of the ischium and is inserted into the upper part of the linea quadrata that is the line which extends vertically downward from the intertrochanteric crest a bursa is often found between the front of this muscle and the lesser trochanter sometimes absent the obturator externus is a flat triangular muscle which covers the outer surface of the anterior wall of the pelvis it arises from the margin of bone immediately around the medial side of the obturator foramen viz from the rami of the pubis and the inferior ramus of the ischium it also arises from the medial two-thirds of the outer surface of the obturator membrane and from the tendinous arch which completes the canal for the passage of the obturator vessels and nerves the fibers springing from the pubic arch extend on to the inner surface of the bone where they obtain a narrow origin between the margin of the foramen and the attachment of the obturator membrane the fibers converge and pass backward lateral ward and upward and end in a tendon which runs across the back of the neck of the femur and lower part of the capsule of the hip joint and is inserted into the trochanteric fossa of the femur the obturator vessels lie between the muscle and the obturator membrane the anterior branch of the obturator nerve reaches the thigh by passing in front of the muscle and the posterior branch by piercing it nerves the gluteus maximus is supplied by the fifth lumbar and first and second sacra nerves through the inferior gluteal nerve the glutei medius and minimus and the tensor fasci lati by the fourth and fifth lumbar and first sacral nerves through the superior gluteal the piriformis is supplied by the first and second sacral nerves the gemellus inferior and quadratus femoris by the last lumbar and first sacral nerves the gemellus superior and obturator internus by the first second and third sacral nerves and the obturator externus by the third and fourth lumbar nerves through the obturator actions when the gluteus maximus takes its fixed point from the pelvis it extends the femur and brings the bent thigh into a line with the body taking its fixed point from below it acts upon the pelvis supporting it and the trunk upon the head of the femur this is especially obvious in standing on one leg its most powerful action is to cause the body to regain the erect position after stooping by drawing the pelvis backward being assisted in this action by the biceps femoris semitendinosus and semimembranosus the gluteus maximus is a tensor of the fascia lata and by its connection with the iliotibial band steadies the femur on the articular surfaces of the tibia during standing when the extensor muscles are relaxed the lower part of the muscle also acts as an adductor and external rotator of the limb the glutei medius and minimus abduct the thigh when the limb is extended and are principally called into action in supporting the body on one limb in conjunction with the tensor fasci lati their anterior fibers by drawing the greater trochanter forward rotate the thigh inward in which action they are also assisted by the tensor fasci lati the tensor fasci lati is a tensor of the fascia lata. Continuing its action, the oblique direction of its fibers enables it to abduct the thigh and to rotate it inward. In the erect posture, acting from below, it will serve to steady the pelvis upon the head of the femur, and by means of the iliotibial band it steadies the condyles of the femur on the articular surfaces of the tibia, and assists the gluteus maximus in supporting the knee in the extended position. The remaining muscles are powerful external rotators of the thigh. In the sitting posture, 
when the thigh is flexed upon the pelvis their action as rotators ceases and they become abductors with the exception of the obturator externus which still rotates the femur outward four the posterior femoral muscles hamstring muscles biceps femoris semitendinosus semimembranosus the biceps femoris biceps is situated on the posterior and lateral aspect of the thigh it has two heads of origin one the long head arises from the lower and inner impression on the back part of the tuberosity of the ischium by a tendon common to it and the semitendinosus and from the lower part of the sacrotuberous ligament the other the short head arises from the lateral lip of the linea aspera between the adductor magnus and vastus lateralis extending up almost as high as the insertion of the gluteus maximus from the lateral prolongation of the linea aspera to within five centimeters of the lateral condyle and from the lateral intermuscular septum the fibers of the long head form a fusiform belly which passes obliquely downward and lateralward across the sciatic nerve to end in an aponeurosis which covers the posterior surface of the muscle and receives the fibers of the short head this aponeurosis becomes gradually contracted into a tendon which is inserted into the lateral side of the head of the fibula and by a small slip into the lateral condyle of the tibia at its insertion the tendon divides into two portions which embrace the fibular collateral ligament of the knee joint from the posterior border of the tendon a thin expansion is given off to the fascia of the leg the tendon of insertion of this muscle forms the lateral hamstring the common personeal nerve descends along its medial border variations the short head may be absent additional heads may arise from the ischial tuberosity the linea aspera the medial supracondylar ridge of the femur or from various other parts a slip may pass to the gastrocnemius the semitendinosus remarkable for the great length of its tendon of insertion is situated at the posterior and medial aspect of the thigh it arises from the lower and medial impression on the tuberosity of the ischium by a tendon common to it and the long head of the biceps femoris it also arises from an aponeurosis which connects the adjacent surfaces of the two muscles to the extent of about seven and a half centimeters from their origin the muscle is fusiform and ends a little below the middle of the thigh in a long round tendon which lies along the medial side of the popliteal fossa it then curves around the medial condyle of the tibia and passes over the tibial collateral ligament of the knee joint from which it is separated by a bursa and is inserted into the upper part of the medial surface of the body of the tibia nearly as far forward as its anterior crest at its insertion it gives off from its lower border a prolongation to the deep fascia of the leg and lies behind the tendon of the sartorius and below that of the gracilis to which it is united a tendinous intersection is usually observed about the middle of the muscle the semimembranosus so called from its membranous tendon of origin is situated at the back and medial side of the thigh it arises by a thick tendon from the upper and outer impression on the tuberosity of the ischium above and lateral to the biceps femoris and semitendinosus the tendon of origin expands into an aponeurosis which covers the upper part of the anterior surface of the muscle from this aponeurosis muscular fibers arise and converge to another aponeurosis which covers the lower part of the posterior surface of the muscle and contracts into the tendon of insertion it is inserted mainly into the horizontal groove on the posterior medial aspect of the medial condyle of the tibia. The tendon of insertion gives off certain fibrous expansions. One, of considerable size, passes upward and lateralward to be inserted into the back part of the lateral condyle of the femur, forming part of the oblique popliteal ligament of the knee joint. A second is continued downward to the fascia which covers the popliteus muscle, while a few fibers join the tibial collateral ligament of the the joint and the fascia of the leg the muscle overlaps the upper part of the popliteal vessels variations it may be reduced or absent or double arising mainly from the sacrotuberous ligament and giving a slip to the femur or adductor magnus the tendons of insertion of the two preceding muscles form the medial hamstrings nerves the muscles of this region are supplied by the fourth and fifth lumbar and the first second and third sacral nerves 
the nerve to the short head of the biceps femoris is derived from the common perineal the other muscles are supplied through the tibial nerve actions the hamstring muscles flex the leg upon the thigh when the knee is semi-flexed the biceps femoris in consequence of its oblique direction rotates the leg slightly outward and the semitendinosus and to a slight extent the semimembranosus rotate the leg inward assisting the popliteus taking their fixed point from below these muscles serve to support the pelvis upon the head of the femur and to draw the trunk directly backward as in raising it from the stooping position or in feats of strength when the body is thrown backward in the form of an arch as already indicated complete flexion of the hip cannot be effected unless the knee joint is also flexed on account of the shortness of the hamstring muscles end of section fifty one Recording by Selena Arter. Section 52 of Gray's Anatomy, Part 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Laurie Ann Walden. Anatomy of the Human Body, Part 2, by Henry Gray. The Muscles and Fascia of the Leg, Part 1. The muscles of the leg may be divided into three groups, anterior, posterior, and lateral. 1. The anterior crural muscles. Tibialis anterior, extensor digitorum longus, extensor hallucis longus, perineus tertius. Deep fascia, fascia cruris. The deep fascia of the leg forms a complete investment to the muscles, and is fused with the periosteum over the subcutaneous surfaces of the bones. It is continuous above with the fascia lata, and is attached around the knee to the patella, the ligamentum patellae, the tuberosity and condyles of the tibia, and the head of the fibula. Behind it forms the popliteal fascia, covering in the popliteal fossa, here it is strengthened by transverse fibers and perforated by the small saphenous vein it receives an expansion from the tendon of the biceps femoris laterally and from the tendons of the sartorius gracilis semitendinosus and semimembranosus medially in front it blends with the periosteum covering the subcutaneous surface of the tibia and with that covering the head and malleolus of the fibula below it is continuous with the transverse crural and laciniate ligaments it is thick and dense in the upper and anterior part of the leg and gives attachment by its deep surface to the tibialis anterior and extensor digitorum longus but thinner behind where it covers the gastrocnemius and soleus it gives off from its deep surface on the lateral side of the leg two strong intermuscular septa the anterior and posterior perineal septa, which enclose the perinei longus and brevis, and separate them from the muscles of the anterior and posterior crural regions, and several more slender processes, which enclose the individual muscles in each region. A broad transverse intermuscular septum, called the deep transverse fascia of the leg, intervenes between the superficial and deep posterior crural muscles. The tibialis anterior, tibialis anticus, is situated on the lateral side of the tibia. It is thick and fleshy above, tendinous below. It arises from the lateral condyle and upper half, or two-thirds of the lateral surface, of the body of the tibia, from the adjoining part of the interosseous membrane, from the deep surface of the fascia, and from the intermuscular septum between it and the extensor digitorum longus. The fibers run vertically downward and end in a tendon, which is apparent on the anterior surface of the muscle at the lower third of the leg. After passing through the most medial compartments of the transverse and cruciate crural ligaments, it is inserted into the medial and under surface of the first cuneiform bone and the base of the first metatarsal bone. This muscle overlaps the anterior tibial vessels and deep perineal nerve in the upper part of the leg. Variations A deep portion of the muscle is rarely inserted into the talus, 
or a tendinous slip may pass to the head of the first metatarsal bone, or the base of the first phalanx of the great toe. The tibiofascialis anterior, a small muscle from the lower part of the tibia to the transverse or cruciate crural ligaments, or deep fascia. The extensor hallucis longus, extensor proprius hallucis, is a thin muscle situated between the tibialis anterior and the extensor digitorum longus. It arises from the anterior surface of the fibula, for about the middle two-fourths of its extent, medial to the origin of the extensor digitorum longus. It also arises from the interosseous membrane to a similar extent. The anterior tibial vessels and deep perineal nerve lie between it and the tibialis anterior. The fibers pass downward and end in a tendon, which occupies the anterior border of the muscle, passes through a distinct compartment in the cruciate crural ligament, crosses from the lateral to the medial side of the anterior tibial vessels near the bend of the ankle, and is inserted into the base of the distal phalanx of the great toe. Opposite the metatarsophalangeal articulation, the tendon gives off a thin prolongation on either side to cover the surface of the joint. An expansion from the medial side of the tendon is usually inserted into the base of the proximal phalanx. Variations Occasionally united at its origin with the extensor digitorum longus, extensor ossus metatarsi hallucis, a small muscle, sometimes found as a slip from the extensor hallucis longus, or from the tibialis anterior, or from the extensor digitorum longus, or as a distinct muscle, it traverses the same compartment of the transverse ligament with the extensor hallucis longus. The extensor digitorum longus is a piniform muscle, situated at the lateral part of the front of the leg. It arises from the lateral condyle of the tibia, from the upper three-fourths of the anterior surface of the body of the fibula, from the upper part of the interosseous membrane, from the deep surface of the fascia, and from the intermuscular septa between it and the tibialis anterior on the medial, and the perinei on the lateral side. Between it and the tibialis anterior are the upper portions of the anterior tibial vessels and deep perineal nerve. The tendon passes under the transverse and cruciate crural ligaments, in company with the perineus tertius, and divides into four slips, which run forward on the dorsum of the foot, and are inserted into the second and third phalanges of the four lesser toes. The tendons to the second, third, and fourth toes are each joined opposite the metatarsophalangeal articulation, on the lateral side by a tendon of the extensor digitorum brevis. The tendons are inserted in the following manner. Each receives a fibrous expansion from the interossei and lumbricalis, and then spreads out into a broad aponeurosis, which covers the dorsal surface of the first phalanx. This aponeurosis, at the articulation of the first with the second phalanx, divides into three slips, an intermediate, which is inserted into the base of the second phalanx, and two collateral slips, which, after uniting on the dorsal surface of the second phalanx, are continued onward, to be inserted into the base of the third phalanx. Variations This muscle varies considerably in the modes of origin and the arrangement of its various tendons. The tendons to the second and fifth toes may be found doubled, or extra slips are given off from one or more tendons to their corresponding metatarsal bones, or to the short extensor, or to one of the interosseous muscles. A slip to the great toe from the innermost tendon has been found. The perineus tertius is a part of the extensor digitorum longus, and might be described as its fifth tendon. The fibers belonging to this tendon arise from the lower third or more of the anterior surface of the fibula, from the lower part of the interosseous membrane, and from an intermuscular septum between it and the perineus brevis. The tendon, after passing under the transverse and cruciate crural ligaments, in the same canal as the extensor digitorum longus, is inserted into the dorsal surface of the base of the metatarsal bone of the little toe. This muscle is sometimes wanting. Nerves. These muscles are supplied by the fourth and fifth lumbar, 
and first sacral nerves through the deep perineal nerve. Actions. The tibialis anterior and perineus tertius are the direct flexors of the foot at the ankle joint. The former muscle, when acting in conjunction with the tibialis posterior, raises the medial border of the foot, i.e., inverts the foot, and the latter, acting with the perinei brevis and longus, raises the lateral border of the foot, i.e., everts the foot. The extensor digitorum longus and extensor hallucis longus extend the phalanges of the toes, and, continuing their action, flex the foot upon the leg. Taking their fixed points from below, in the erect posture, all these muscles serve to fix the bones of the leg in the perpendicular position, and give increased strength to the ankle joint. 2. The posterior crural muscles. The muscles of the back of the leg are subdivided into two groups, superficial and deep. Those of the superficial group constitute a powerful muscular mass, forming the calf of the leg. Their large size is one of the most characteristic features of the muscular apparatus in man, and bears a direct relation to his erect attitude and his mode of progression. The superficial group, gastrocnemius, soleus, plantaris. The gastrocnemius is the most superficial muscle, and forms the greater part of the calf. It arises by two heads, which are connected to the condyles of the femur by strong, flat tendons. The medial and larger head takes its origin from a depression at the upper and back part of the medial condyle, and from the adjacent part of the femur. The lateral head arises from an impression on the side of the lateral condyle, and from the posterior surface of the femur, immediately above the lateral part of the condyle. Both heads, also, arise from the subjacent part of the capsule of the knee. Each tendon spreads out into an aponeurosis, which covers the posterior surface of that portion of the muscle to which it belongs. From the anterior surfaces of these tendinous expansions, muscular fibers are given off, those of the medial head being thicker and extending lower than those of the lateral. The fibers unite at an angle in the middle line of the muscle in a tendinous rathe, which expands into a broad aponeurosis on the anterior surface of the muscle, and into this the remaining fibers are inserted. The aponeurosis, gradually contracting, unites with the tendon of the soleus, and forms with it the tendocalcaneus. Variations Absence of the outer head, or of the entire muscle extra slips from the popliteal surface of the femur. The soleus is a broad, flat muscle situated immediately in front of the gastrocnemius. It arises by tendinous fibers from the back of the head of the fibula and from the upper third of the posterior surface of the body of the bone, from the popliteal line and the middle third of the medial border of the tibia. Some fibers also arise from a tendinous arch placed between the tibial and fibular origins of the muscle, in front of which the popliteal vessels and tibial nerve run. The fibers end in an aponeurosis which covers the posterior surface of the muscle, and, gradually becoming thicker and narrower, joins with the tendon of the gastrocnemius, and forms with it the tendocalcaneus. Variations Accessory head to its lower and inner part, usually ending in the tendocalcaneus, or the calcaneus, or the laciniate ligament. The gastrocnemius and soleus together form a muscular mass which is occasionally described as the triceps surae. Its tendon of insertion is the tendocalcaneus. Tendocalcaneus, tendo Achilles. The tendocalcaneus, the common tendon of the gastrocnemius and soleus, is the thickest and strongest in the body. It is about 15 centimeters long and begins near the middle of the leg, but receives fleshy fibers on its anterior surface almost to its lower end. Gradually becoming contracted below, it is inserted into the middle part of the posterior surface of the calcaneus, a bursa being interposed between the tendon and the upper part of this surface. The tendon spreads out somewhat at its lower end, so that its narrowest part is about four centimeters above its insertion. It is covered by the fascia and the integument, 
and is separated from the deep muscles and vessels by a considerable interval filled up with areolar and adipose tissue. Along its lateral side, but superficial to it, is the small saphenous vein. The plantaris is placed between the gastrocnemius and soleus. It arises from the lower part of the lateral prolongation of the linea aspera and from the oblique popliteal ligament of the knee joint. It forms a small fusiform belly, from seven to ten centimeters long, ending in a long, slender tendon which crosses obliquely between the two muscles of the calf, and runs along the medial border of the tendocalcaneus, to be inserted with it into the posterior part of the calcaneus. This muscle is sometimes double, and at other times wanting. Occasionally its tendon is lost in the laciniate ligament, or in the fascia of the leg. Nerves. The gastrocnemius and soleus are supplied by the first and second sacral nerves, and the plantaris by the fourth and fifth lumbar and first sacral nerves, through the tibial nerve. Actions. The muscles of the calf are the chief extensors of the foot at the ankle joint. They possess considerable power, and are constantly called into use in standing, walking, dancing, and leaping, hence the large size they usually present. In walking, these muscles raise the heel from the ground. The body being thus supported on the raised foot, the opposite limb can be carried forward. In standing, the soleus, taking its fixed point from below, steadies the leg upon the foot and prevents the body from falling forward. The gastrocnemius, acting from below, serves to flex the femur upon the tibia, assisted by the popliteus. The plantaris is the rudiment of a large muscle, which, in some of the lower animals, is continued over the calcaneus to be inserted into the plantar aponeurosis. In man, it is an accessory to the gastrocnemius, extending the ankle if the foot be free, or bending the knee if the foot be fixed. End of section 52「Section 53 of Gray's Anatomy, Part 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Laurie Ann Walden. Anatomy of the Human Body, Part 2, by Henry Gray. The Muscles and Fascia of the Leg, Part 2. The Deep Group. Popliteus, flexor digitorum longus, flexor hallucis longus, Tibialis posterior. Deep transverse fascia. The deep transverse fascia of the leg is a transversely placed intermuscular septum between the superficial and deep muscles of the back of the leg. At the sides it is connected to the margins of the tibia and fibula. Above, where it covers the popliteus, it is thick and dense, and receives an expansion from the tendon of the semimembranosus. It is thinner in the middle of the leg. But below, where it covers the tendons passing behind the malleoli, it is thickened and continuous with the laciniate ligament. The popliteus is a thin, flat, triangular muscle, which forms the lower part of the floor of the popliteal fossa. It arises by a strong tendon about 2.5 centimeters long, from a depression at the anterior part of the groove on the lateral condyle of the femur, and, to a small extent, from the oblique popliteal ligament of the knee joint, and is inserted into the medial two-thirds of the triangular surface above the popliteal line on the posterior surface of the body of the tibia, and into the tendinous expansion covering the surface of the muscle. Variations Additional head from the sesamoid bone in the outer head of the gastrocnemius. Popliteus minor, rare, Origin from femur on the inner side of the plantaris, insertion into the posterior ligament of the knee joint. Peroneotibialis, 14%. Origin, inner side of the head of the fibula, insertion into the upper end of the oblique line of the tibia. It lies beneath the popliteus. The flexor hallucis longus is situated on the fibular side of the leg. It arises from the inferior two-thirds of the posterior surface of the body of the fibula, with the exception of 2.5 centimeters at its lowest part, from the lower part of the interosseous membrane, 
from an intermuscular septum between it and the perineae laterally, and from the fascia covering the tibialis posterior medially. The fibers pass obliquely, downward and backward, and end in a tendon which occupies nearly the whole length of the posterior surface of the muscle. This tendon lies in a groove which crosses the posterior surface of the lower end of the tibia, the posterior surface of the talus, and the under surface of the sustentaculum talli of the calcaneus. In the sole of the foot it runs forward between the two heads of the flexor hallucis brevis, and is inserted into the base of the last phalanx of the great toe. The grooves on the talus and calcaneus, which contain the tendon of the muscle, are converted by tendinous fibers into distinct canals lined by a mucous sheath. As the tendon passes forward in the sole of the foot, it is situated above and crosses from the lateral to the medial side of the tendon of the flexor digitorum longus, to which it is connected by a fibrous slip. Variations Usually a slip runs to the flexor digitorum, and frequently an additional slip runs from the flexor digitorum to the flexor hallucis. Peroneocalcaneus internus, rare, origin below or outside the flexor hallucis from the back of the fibula, passes over the sustentaculum talli with the flexor hallucis and is inserted into the calcaneum. The flexor digitorum longus is situated on the tibial side of the leg. At its origin it is thin and pointed, but it gradually increases in size as it descends. It arises from the posterior surface of the body of the tibia, from immediately below the popliteal line to within seven or eight centimeters of its lower extremity, medial to the tibial origin of the tibialis posterior. It also arises from the fascia covering the tibialis posterior. The fibers end in a tendon, which runs nearly the whole length of the posterior surface of the muscle. This tendon passes behind the medial malleolus in a groove common to it and the tibialis posterior, but separated from the latter by a fibrous septum, each tendon being contained in a special compartment lined by a separate mucous sheath. It passes obliquely forward and lateralward, superficial to the deltoid ligament of the ankle joint, into the sole of the foot, where it crosses below the tendon of the flexor hallucis longus, and receives from it a strong tendinous slip. It then expands and is joined by the quadratus plantae, and finally divides into four tendons, which are inserted into the bases of the last phalanges of the second, third, fourth, and fifth toes, each tendon passing through an opening in the corresponding tendon of the flexor digitorum brevis, opposite the base of the first phalanx. Variations. Flexor accessorius longus digitorum, not infrequent, origin from fibula or tibia or the deep fascia, and ending in a tendon which, after passing beneath the liciniate ligament, joins the tendon of the long flexor or the quadratus plantae. The tibialis posterior, tibialis posticus, lies between the two preceding muscles and is the most deeply seated of the muscles on the back of the leg. It begins above by two pointed processes, separated by an angular interval, through which the anterior tibial vessels pass forward to the front of the leg. It arises from the whole of the posterior surface of the interosseous membrane, excepting its lowest part from the lateral portion of the posterior surface of the body of the tibia, between the commencement of the popliteal line above and the junction of the middle and lower thirds of the body below, and from the upper two-thirds of the medial surface of the fibula. Some fibers also arise from the deep transverse fascia and from the intermuscular septa, separating it from the adjacent muscles. In the lower fourth of the leg, its tendon passes in front of that of the flexor digitorum longus, and lies with it in a groove behind the medial malleolus, but enclosed in a separate sheath. It next passes under the liciniate and over the deltoid ligament into the foot, and then beneath the plantar calcaneonavicular ligament. The tendon contains a sesamoid fibrocartilage, as it runs under the plantar calcaneonavicular ligament. It is inserted into the tuberosity of the navicular bone, 
and gives off fibrous expansions, one of which passes backward to the sustentaculum talli of the calcaneus, others forward and lateralward to the three cuneiforms, the cuboid, and the bases of the second, third, and fourth metatarsal bones. Nerves. The popliteus is supplied by the fourth and fifth lumbar and first sacral nerves, the flexor digitorum longus and tibialis posterior by the fifth lumbar and first sacral, and the flexor hallucis longus by the fifth lumbar and the first and second sacral nerves through the tibial nerve. Actions. The popliteus assists in flexing the leg upon the thigh. When the leg is flexed, it will rotate the tibia inward. It is especially called into action at the beginning of the act of bending the knee, inasmuch as it produces the slight inward rotation of the tibia, which is essential in the early stage of this movement. The tibialis posterior is a direct extensor of the foot at the ankle joint. Acting in conjunction with the tibialis anterior, it turns the sole of the foot upward and medialward, i.e., inverts the foot, antagonizing the perinei, which turn it upward and lateralward, or evert it. In the sole of the foot, the tendon of the tibialis posterior lies directly below the plantar calcaneonavicular ligament, and is therefore an important factor in maintaining the arch of the foot. The flexor digitorum longus and flexor hallucis longus are the direct flexors of the phalanges, and, continuing their action, extend the foot upon the leg. They assist the gastrocnemius and soleus in extending the foot, as in the act of walking, or in standing on tiptoe. In consequence of the oblique direction of its tendons, the flexor digitorum longus would draw the toes medialward, were it not for the quadratus plantae, which is inserted into the lateral side of the tendon, and draws it to the middle line of the foot. Taking their fixed point from the foot, these muscles serve to maintain the upright posture by steadying the tibia and fibula perpendicularly upon the talus. 3. The lateral crural muscles, perineus longus, perineus brevis. The perineus longus is situated at the upper part of the lateral side of the leg, and is the more superficial of the two muscles. It arises from the head and upper two-thirds of the lateral surface of the body of the fibula from the deep surface of the fascia, and from the intermuscular septa between it and the muscles on the front and back of the leg, occasionally also by a few fibers from the lateral condyle of the tibia. Between its attachments to the head and to the body of the fibula, there is a gap through which the common perineal nerve passes to the front of the leg. It ends in a long tendon, which runs behind the lateral malleolus, in a groove common to it and the tendon of the perineus brevis, behind which it lies. The groove is converted into a canal by the superior perineal retinaculum, and the tendons in it are contained in a common mucous sheath. The tendon then extends obliquely forward across the lateral side of the calcaneus, below the trochlear process, and the tendon of the perineus brevis, and under cover of the inferior perineal retinaculum. It crosses the lateral side of the cuboid, and then runs on the under surface of that bone, in a groove which is converted into a canal by the long plantar ligament. The tendon then crosses the sole of the foot obliquely, and is inserted into the lateral side of the base of the first metatarsal bone, and the lateral side of the first cuneiform. Occasionally it sends a slip to the base of the second metatarsal bone. The tendon changes its direction at two points, first behind the lateral malleolus, secondly on the cuboid bone. In both of these situations the tendon is thickened, and in the latter a sesamoid fibrocartilage, sometimes a bone, is usually developed in its substance. The perineus brevis lies under cover of the perineus longus, and is a shorter and smaller muscle. It arises from the lower two-thirds of the lateral surface of the body of the fibula, medial to the perineus longus, and from the intermuscular septa separating it from the adjacent muscles on the front and back of the leg. The fibers pass vertically downward and end in a tendon which runs behind the lateral malleolus, along with, but in front of, that of the preceding muscle, 
the two tendons being enclosed in the same compartment and lubricated by a common mucous sheath. It then runs forward on the lateral side of the calcaneus, above the trochlear process and the tendon of the perineus longus, and is inserted into the tuberosity at the base of the fifth metatarsal bone on its lateral side. On the lateral surface of the calcaneus, the tendons of the perinei longus and brevis occupy separate osseoaponeurotic canals formed by the calcaneus and the perineal retinacula. Each tendon is enveloped by a forward prolongation of the common mucus sheath. Variations Fusion of the two perinei is rare. A slip from the perineus longus to the base of the third, fourth, or fifth metatarsal bone, or to the adductor hallucis, is occasionally seen. Perineus accessorius, origin from the fibula between the longus and brevis, joins the tendon of the longus in the sole of the foot. Perineus quinti digiti, rare, origin lower fourth of the fibula under the brevis, insertion into the extensor aponeurosis of the little toe more common as a slip of the tendon of the perineus brevis. Perineus cortis, 13%, Gruber. Origin, back of fibula, between the brevis and the flexor hallucis. Insertion into the perineal spine of the calcaneum, peroneocalcaneus externum, or, less frequently, into the tuberosity of the cuboid, peroneocuboideus. Nerves. The perinei longus and brevis are supplied by the fourth and fifth lumbar and first sacral nerves through the superficial perineal nerve. Actions. The perinei longus and brevis extend the foot upon the leg in conjunction with the tibialis posterior, antagonizing the tibialis anterior and perineus tertius, which are flexors of the foot. The perineus longus also everts the sole of the foot and from the oblique direction of the tendon across the sole of the foot is an important agent in the maintenance of the transverse arch. Taking their fixed points below, the perinei serve to steady the leg upon the foot. This is especially the case in standing upon one leg, when the tendency of the superincumbent weight is to throw the leg medialward. The perineus longus overcomes this tendency by drawing on the lateral side of the leg. End of section 53. Section 54 of Gray's Anatomy, Part 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Anatomy of the Human Body, Part 2, by Henry Gray. The Fasciae Around the Ankle. Fibrous bands, or thickened portions of the fascia, bind down the tendons in front of and behind the ankle in their passage to the foot. They comprise three ligaments, that is, the transverse cruel, the cruciate cruel, and the licinate, and the superior and inferior perineal retinacula. Transverse cruel ligament Ligamentum transversum cruris Upper part of anterior annular ligament. The transverse cruel ligament binds down the tendons of extensor digitorum longus, extensor hallucis longus, perineus tertius, and tibialis anterior, as they descend on the front of the tibia and fibula. Under it are found also the anterior tibial vessels and deep perineal nerve. It is attached laterally to the lower end of the fibula, and medially to the tibia. Above, it is continuous with the fascia of the leg. Cruciate Cruel Ligament Ligamentum Cruciatum Cruris Lower part of anterior annular ligament The Cruciate Cruel Ligament is a Y-shaped band placed in front of the ankle joint. The stem of the Y being attached laterally to the upper surface of the calcaneus, in front of the depression for the interosseous talocanian ligament. It is directed medialward as a double layer, one lamina passing in front of, and the other behind, the tendons of the perineus tertius and extensor digitorum longus. 
At the medial border of the latter tendon, these two layers join together, forming a compartment in which the tendons are enclosed. From the medial extremity of this sheath, the two limbs of the Y diverge. One is directed upward and medialward, to be attached to the tibial malleolus, passing over the extensor hallucis longus and the vessels and nerves, but enclosing the tibialis anterior by a splitting of its fibers. The other limb extends downward and medialward, to be attached to the border of the plantar aponeurosis, and passes over the tendons of the extensor hallucis longus and tibialis anterior, and also the vessels and nerves. Liciniate Ligament Ligamentum Liciniatum Internal Annular Ligament The Liciniate Ligament is a strong fibrous band, extending from the tibial malleolus above to the margin of the calcaneus below, converting a series of bony grooves in this situation into canals for the passage of the tendons of the flexor muscles and the posterior tibial vessels and the tibial nerve into the sole of the foot. It is continuous by its upper border with the deep fascia of the leg, and by its lower border with the plantar aponeurosis, and the fibres of origin of the abductor hyacis muscle. Enumerated from the medial side, the four canals which it forms transmit the tendon of the tibialis posterior, the tendon of the flexor digitorum longus, the posterior tibial vessels and tibial nerve, which run through a broad space beneath the ligament, and lastly, in a canal formed partly by the talus, the tendon of the flexor hallucis longus. Perineal Retinacula The perineal retinacula are fibrous bands which bind down the tendons of the perinei longus and brevis, as they run across the lateral side of the ankle. The fibres of the superior retinaculum, external annular ligament, are attached above to the latter malleolus and below to the lateral surface of the calcaneus. The fibres of the inferior retinaculum are continuous in front with those of the cruciate cruel ligament. Behind, they are attached to the lateral surface of the calcaneus. Some of the fibres are fixed to the perineal trochlea forming a septum between the tendons of the perinei longus and brevis. THE MUCUS SHEATHS OF THE TENDONS AROUND THE ANKLE All the tendons crossing the ankle joint are enclosed for part of their length in mucus sheaths, which have an almost uniform length of about 8 cm each. On the front of the ankle, the sheath for the tibialis anterior extends from the upper margin of the transverse cruel ligament, to the interval between the diverging limbs of the cruciate ligament. Those for the extensor digitorum longus and extensor hyacis longus reach upward to just above the level of the tips of the malleoli, the former being the higher. The sheath of the extensor hyacis longus is prolonged on the base of the first metatarsal bone while that of the extensor digitorum longus reaches only to the level of the base of the fifth metatarsal. On the medial side of the ankle, the sheath for the tibialis posterior extends highest up, to about four centimeters above the tip of the malleolus, while below it stops just short of the tuberosity of the navicular. The sheath for the flexor hallucis longus reaches up to the level of the tip of the malleolus, while that for the flexor digitorum longus is slightly higher. The former is continued to the base of the first metatarsal, but the latter stops opposite the first cuneiform bone. On the lateral side of the ankle, a sheath, which is single for the greater part of its extent, encloses the perinei longus and brevis. It extends upward for about four centimeters above the tip of the malleolus, and downward and forward for about the same distance. End of section 54。section 55 of Gray's Anatomy Part 2。this is a LibriVox recording。all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain。for more information or to volunteer。Please visit librivox.org.
Recording by The Bodster. Anatomy of the Human Body, Part 2, by Henry Gray. Section 8E, The Muscles and Fascia of the Foot. The dorsal muscle of the foot, extensor digitorum brevis. The fascia on the dorsum of the foot is a thin membranous layer, continuous above with the transverse and cruciate crural ligaments. On either side it blends with the plantar aponeurosis. Anteriorly it forms a sheath for the tendons on the dorsum of the foot. The extensor digitorum brevis is a broad thin muscle which arises from the forepart of the upper and lateral surfaces of the calcaneus in front of the groove for the perineus brevis from the lateral talocalcanean ligament, and from the common limb of the cruciate crural ligament. It passes obliquely across the dorsum of the foot and ends in four tendons. The most medial, which is the largest, is inserted into the dorsal surface of the base of the first phalanx of the great toe, crossing the dorsalis pedis artery. It is frequently described as a separate muscle, the extensor hallucis brevis. The other three are inserted into the lateral sides of the tendon of the extensor digitorum longus of the second, third and fourth toes. Variations Accessory slips of origin from the talus and navicular or from the external cuneiform and third metatarsal bones to the second slip of the muscle and one from the cuboid to the third slip have been observed. The tendons vary in number and position. They may be reduced to two, or one of them may be doubled, or an additional slip may pass to the little toe. A supernumerary slip ending on one of the metatarsophalangeal articulations, or joining a dorsal interosseous muscle, is not uncommon. Deep slips between the muscle and the dorsal interosseae occur. Nerves. It is supplied by the deep perineal nerve. Actions. The extensor digitorum brevis extends the phalanges of the four toes into which it is inserted, but in the great toe acts only on the first phalanx. The obliquity of its direction counteracts the oblique movement given to the toes by the long extensor, so that when both muscles act, the toes are evenly extended. The plantar muscles of the foot. Plantar aponeurosis. Aponeurosis plantaris plantar fascia. The plantar aponeurosis is of great strength and consists of pearly white glistening fibres disposed for the most part longitudinally. It is divided into central, lateral and media portions. The central portion, the thickest, is narrow behind and attached to the medial process of the tuberosity of the calcaneus, posterior to the origin of the flexor digitorum brevis and becoming broader and thinner in front, divides near the heads of the metatarsal bones into five processes, one for each of the toes. Each of these processes divides opposite the metatarsophalangeal articulation into two strata, superficial and deep. The superficial stratum is inserted into the skin of the transverse sulcus, which separates the toes from the sole. The deeper stratum divides into two slips which embrace the side of the flexor tendons of the toes and blend with the sheaths of the tendons and with the transverse metatarsal ligament, thus forming a series of arches through which the tendons of the short and long flexors pass to the toes. The intervals left between the five processes allow the digital vessels and nerves and the tendons of the lumbricales to become superficial. At the point of division of the aponeurosis, numerous transverse fasciculi are superadded. These serve to increase the strength of the aponeurosis at this part by binding the processes together and connecting them with the integument. The central portion of the plantar aponeurosis is continuous with the lateral and medial portions that sends upward to the foot at the lines of junction two strong vertical intermuscular septa broader in front than behind, which separate the intermediate from the lateral and medial plantar groups of muscles. From these again are derived thinner transverse septa, which separate the various layers of muscles in this region. The upper surface of this aponeurosis, 
gives origin behind to the flexor digitorum brevis. The lateral and medial portions of the plantar aponeurosis are thinner than the central piece and cover the sides of the sole of the foot. The lateral portion covers the undersurface of the abductor digiti quinti. It is thin in front and thick behind, where it forms a strong band between the lateral process of the tuberosity of the calcaneus and the base of the fifth metatarsal bone. It is continuous medially with the central portion of the plantar aponeurosis and laterally with the dorsal fascia. The medial portion is thin and covers the undersurface of the abductor hallucis. It is attached behind to the laciniate ligament and is continuous around the side of the foot with the dorsal fascia and laterally with the central portion of the plantar aponeurosis. The muscles in the plantar region of the foot may be divided into three groups, in a similar manner to those in the hand. Those of the medial plantar region are connected with the great toe and correspond with those of the thumb. Those of the lateral plantar region are connected with the little toe and correspond with those of the little finger. And those of the intermediate plantar region are connected with the tendons intervening between the two former groups. But in order to facilitate the description of these muscles, it is more convenient to divide them into four layers in the order in which they are successively exposed. The first layer. Abductor hallucis, flexor digitorum brevis, and abductor digiti quinti. The abductor hallucis lies along the medial border of the foot and covers the origins of the plantar vessels and nerves. It arises from the medial process of the tuberosity of the calcaneus, from the laciniate ligament, and from the plantar aponeurosis, and from the intermuscular septum between it and the flexor digitorum brevis. The fibres end in a tendon, which is inserted together with the medial tendon of the flexor hallucis brevis, into the tibial side of the base of the phalanx of the great toe. Variations slip to the base of the first phalanx of the second toe. The flexor digitorum brevis lies in the middle of the sole of the foot, immediately above the central part of the plantar aponeurosis, with which it is firmly united. Its deep surface is separated from the lateral plantar vessels and nerves by a thin layer of fascia. It arises by a narrow tendon from the medial process of the tuberosity of the calcaneus, from the central part of the plantar aponeurosis, and from the intermuscular septa between it and the adjacent muscles. It passes forward and divides into four tendons, one for each of the four lesser toes. Opposite the bases of the first phalanges, each tendon divides into two slips to allow the passage of the corresponding tendon of the flexor digitorum longus. The two portions of the tendon then unite and form a grooved channel for the reception of the accompanying long flexor tendon. Finally, it divides a second time and is inserted into the sides of the second phalanx about its middle. The mode of division of the tendons of the flexor digitorum brevis and of their insertion into the phalanges is analogous to that of the tendons of the flexor digitorum sublimus in the hand. Variations slip to the little toe frequently wanting 23% or it may be replaced by a small fusiform muscle arising from the long flexor tendon or from the quadratus plantae. Fibrous sheaths of the flexor tendons. The terminal portions of the tendons of the long and short flexor muscles are contained in the osseoaponeurotic canals similar in their arrangement to those in the fingers. These canals are formed above by the phalanges and below by the fibrous bands which arch across the tendons and are attached on either side to the margins of the phalanges. Opposite the bodies of the proximal and second phalanges, the fibrous bands are strong and the fibres are transverse, but opposite the joints they are much thinner and the fibres are directed obliquely. Each canal contains a mucous sheath which is reflected on the contained tendons. The abductor digiti quinti, abductor minimi digiti, lies along the lateral border of the foot and is in relation to its medial margin with the lateral plantar vessels and nerves. It arises by a broad origin from the lateral process of the tuberosity of the calcaneus. 
from the undersurface of the calcaneus between the two processes of the tuberosity, from the forepart of the medial process, from the plantar aponeurosis, and from the intermuscular septum between it and the flexor digitorum brevis. Its tendon, after gliding over a smooth facet on the undersurface of the base of the fifth metatarsal bone, is inserted with the flexor digiti quinti brevis into the fibula side of the base of the first phalanx of the fifth toe. Variations. Slips of origin from the tuberosity at the base of the fifth metatarsal. Abductor ossus metatarsi quinti, origin external tubercle of the calcaneus, insertion into the tuberosity of the fifth metatarsal bone in common with or beneath the outer margin of the plantar fascia. The second layer, quadratus plantae and lumbricalis. The quadratus plantae, flexor accessorius, is separated from the muscles of the first layer by the lateral plantar vessels and nerve. It arises by two heads, which are separated from each other by the long plantar ligament. The medial or larger head is muscular and is attached to the medial concave surface of the calcaneus, below the groove which lodges the tendon of the flexor hallucis longus. The lateral head, flat and tendinous, arises from the lateral border of the inferior surface of the calcaneus, in front of the lateral process of its tuberosity, and from the long plantar ligament. The two portions join at an acute angle, and end in a flattened band which is inserted into the lateral margin and upper and under surfaces of the tendon of the flexor digitorum longus forming a kind of groove in which the tendon is lodged. It usually sends slips to those tendons of the flexor digitorum longus, which pass to the second, third and fourth toes. Variations. Lateral head often wanting, entire muscle absent. Variation in the number of digital tendons to which fibres can be traced. Most frequent offsets are sent to the second, third and fourth toes. In many cases to the fifth as well, occasionally to two toes only. The lumbricalis are four small muscles, accessory to the tendons of the flexor digitorum longus, and numbered from the medial side of the foot. They arise from these tendons as far back as their angles of division, each springing from two tendons, except the first. The muscles end in tendons, which pass forward on the medial sides of the four lesser toes, and are inserted into the expansions of the tendons of the extensor digitorum longus on the dorsal surfaces of the first phalanges. Variations. Absence of one or more. Doubling of the third or fourth. Insertion partly or wholly into the first phalanges. The third layer. Flexor hallucis brevis, adductor hallucis, flexor digiti quinti brevis. The flexor hallucis brevis arises by a pointed tenderness process from the medial part of the undersurface of the cuboid bone from the contiguous portion of the third cuneiform and from the prolongation of the tendon of the tibialis posterior, which is attached to that bone. It divides in front into two portions, which are inserted into the medial and lateral sides of the base of the first phalanx of the great toe, a sesamoid bone being present in each tendon at its insertion. The medial portion is blended with the abductor hallucis previous to its insertion the lateral portion of the adductor hallucis. The tendon of the flexor hallucis longus lies in a groove between them. The lateral portion is sometimes described as the first interosseous plantaris. Variations. Origin subject to considerable variation. It often receives fibres from the calcaneus or long plantar ligament. Attachment to the cuboid sometimes wanting. Slip to first phalanx of second toe. The adductor hallucis, adductor obliquus hallucis, arises by two heads, oblique and transverse. The oblique head is a large, thick, fleshy mass, crossing the foot obliquely and occupying the hollow space under the first, second, third and fourth metatarsal bones. It arises from the bases of the second, third and fourth metatarsal bones and from the sheath of the tendon of the peroneus longus and is inserted together with the lateral portion of the flexor hallucis brevis, into the lateral side of the base of the first phalanx of the great toe. The transverse head, transversus pedis, is a narrow, flat fasciculus, 
which arises from the plantar, metatarsophalangeal ligaments of the third, fourth and fifth toes, sometimes only from the third and fourth, and from the transverse ligament of the metatarsus. It is inserted into the lateral side of the base of the first phalanx of the great toe, its fibres blending with the tendon of insertion of the oblique head. Variations. Slips to the base of the first phalanx of the second toe, opponens halicus, occasional slips from the adductor to the metatarsal bone of the great toe. The abductor, flexor brevis and adductor of the great toe, like the similar muscles of the thumb, give off, at their insertions, fibrous expansions to blend with the tendons of the extensor digitorum longus. The flexor digiti quinti brevis, flexor brevis minimi digiti, lies under the metatarsal bone of the little toe and resembles one of the interossi. It arises from the base of the fifth metatarsal bone and from the sheath of the perioneus longus. Its tendon is inserted into the lateral side of the base of the first phalanx of the fifth toe. Occasionally, a few of the deeper fibres are inserted into the lateral part of the distal half of the fifth metatarsal bone. These are described by some as a distinct muscle, the opponens digiti quinti. The fourth layer, interossei. The interossei in the foot are similar to those in the hand, with this exception that they are grouped around the middle line of the second digit instead of that of the third. They are seven in number and consist of two groups, dorsal and plantar. The interossei dorsalis, dorsalis interossei, four in number, are situated between the metatarsal bones. They are bipenniform muscles, each arising by two heads from the adjacent sides of the metatarsal bones between which it is placed. Their tendons are inserted into the bases of the first phalanges and into the aponeurosis of the tendons of the extensor digitorum longus. In the angular interval left between the heads of each of the three lateral muscles, one of the perforating arteries passes to the dorsum of the foot. Through the space between the heads of the first muscle, the deep plantar branch of the dorsalis pedis artery enters the sole of the foot. The first is inserted into the medial side of the second toe. The other three are inserted into the lateral sides of the second, third and fourth toes. The interossei plantaris, plantar interossei, three in number, lie beneath rather than between the metatarsal bones, and each is connected with but one metatarsal bone. They arise from the bases and medial sides of the bodies of the third, fourth and fifth metatarsal bones, and are inserted into the medial sides of the bases of the first phalanges of the same toes, and into the aponeuroses of the tendons of the extensor digitorum longus. Nerves. The flexor digitorum brevis, the flexor halicus brevis, the abductor halicus, and the first lumbricalis are supplied by the medial plantar nerve. All the other muscles in the sole of the foot by the lateral plantar. The first interosseous dorsalis frequently receives an extra filament from the medial branch of the deep perineal nerve on the dorsum of the foot, and the second interosseous dorsalis, a twig from the lateral branch of the same nerve. Actions. All the muscles of the foot act upon the toes and may be grouped as abductors, adductors, flexors, or extensors. The abductors are the interossei dorsalis, the abductor halicus, and the abductor digiti quinti. The interossei dorsalis our abductors from an imaginary line passing through the axis of the second toe, so that the first muscle draws the second toe medialward toward the great toe, the second muscle draws the same toe lateralward, and the third and fourth draw the third and fourth toes in the same direction. Like the interossei in the hand, each assists in flexing the first phalanx and extending the second and third phalanges. The abductor halicus abducts the great toe from the second and also flexes its proximal phalanx. In the same way, the action of the abductor digiti quinti is twofold, as an abductor of this toe from the fourth and also as a flexor of its proximal phalanx. The adductors are the interossei plantaris and the adductor halicus. 
the Interossei plantaris adduct the third, fourth and fifth toes towards the imaginary line passing through the second toe, and by means of their insertions into the aponeuroses of the extensor tendons, they assist in flexing the proximal phalanges and extending the middle and terminal phalanges. The oblique head of the adductor hallucis is chiefly concerned in adducting the great toe toward the second one, but also assists in flexing this toe. The transverse head approximates all the toes and thus increases the curve of the transverse arch of the metatarsus. The flexors are the flexor digitorum brevis, the quadratus plantae, the flexor hallucis brevis, the flexor digiti quinti brevis, and the lumbricalis. The flexor digitorum brevis flexes the second phalanges upon the first, and continuing its action, flexes the first phalanges also, and brings the toes together. The quadratus plantae assists the flexor digitorum longus and converts the oblique pull of the tendons of that muscle into a direct backward pull upon the toes. The flexor digiti quinti brevis flexes the little toe and draws its metatarsal bone downward and medialward. The lumbricalis, like the corresponding muscles in the hand, assist in flexing the proximal phalanges, and by their insertions into the tendons of the extensor digitorum longus, aid that muscle in straightening the middle and terminal phalanges. The extensor digitorum brevis extends the first phalanx of the great toe and assists the long extensor in extending the next three toes, and at the same time gives to the toes a lateral direction when they are extended. End of section 55, and also the end of Anatomy of the Human Body, Part 2, by Henry Gray. Recording by The Bodster.